From Screen Junkie Studios in the heart of Los Angeles, this is Screen Junkies Movie Fights. Now your host, Andy Signor. Hello, Screen Junkies. Welcome to a championship battle here. The winner of today's fight will finally go into a belt battle against our champion, Mr. Dan Murrow. On the couch, there he is. That was a very Oprah intro. <laughs> Mr. Murrow. Dan Murrow. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this, I can't wait. This is this is epic. You got three challenges. Challenges who earned their right here through three different uh, three different methods. Mm -hmm. Mance sort of <laughs> got here because Mance and Roca wanted to fight. And Mance they, and Roca. They deserved it. They, yeah. They've earned it over the times. But you beat Roca to get here. Scott Mance, welcome, movie Mance. Thank you so much, Green Junkies fans. Woo! Let's do this. You, mm -hmm. Are you nervous here? Psh, no. If one, if you guys okay. win, you will go on a one-on-one -on -one fight against I'll the man over there. I'll be nervous, but I'm not nervous right now. All right. Well, that's <laughs> going to get exciting. Next up, he <laughs> won the fan choice round. Hashtag Botanicus! Mike <laughs> Coulson! Mikey! Hi, hello everyone. Uh, I've got my costume of a uh, man in a little tiny green hat today. <laughs> uh, I'm excited to be back and I'm ready to go. How are you feeling? Nerves? No? Come on. Uh, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, sure. I mean, no, this look, this show is a nightmare to do. It's a nightmare. <laughs> you have, like, no time to prepare. You have to... I'm frantically writing stuff. Movies I haven't seen We're in years. We're all screaming at each other before the show starts. Yeah, <laughs> going on Wikipedia. <laughs> anyway, so it's fine. I'll, 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 I'm fine. Everything's good. All right, all right. good. Can you I point them? out for posterity, by the way, that Mike Carlson... Also beat Roka to get here. Yes, Ooh, that's oh, true. I love it. <laughs> Anyone wow. who beats Roka is a friend in my book. <laughs> well, Mike, you had a shot at the belt way long ago. One of our first live yeah, shows, like two years ago, maybe. Uh, you and Amy, I think, had the had a shot mm -hmm. against Dan. And Dan, you took him down. You, you've had the belt the whole line. This is going to be exciting. I, who knows? But I liked the battle you had against Max, where you chose to put the belt on. No, the one-on-one -on -one fights. A one-on-one -on -one so -on -one fight fun. is really yes. going to be worthy, and then we'll, we'll see what happens after that. But uh, this is exciting. Last up. Uh, he won the, uh, what, what was yours called? It was I the champ's kept, choice. I just kept winning. Yours was happened. the champ's choice. <laughs> JTE, yeah. welcome. The champ's choice. Dan got to pick three people he wanted mm -hmm. them to fight. You yep. were on that list, and you that was a really tough battle. Yeah, Dan's brave. He put a lot of tough fighters on it, but I understand where he's coming from. You want to fight the best, and that's why I'm excited to fight uh, Mike here, because I've been watching Mike since day one. No, thanks Listen, for that. No, thank you very much. No, no, tough. no. I'm not throwing you under the bus. I played you before. Jeez. I played you before. I just want to play new opponents to see how I play against them. I did beat you once before. I'm looking forward to trying to beat Mike today. Oh, That's all. Oh, not going to beat me today. Oh, oh, oh. I'm not going to beat those it's, words, it's mister. It's going to be a tough match, I'm just saying. I'm have the three, have you fought Mike before? No, I never fought Mike. Oh, wow. Mike. We, we did like a Comic-Con, I think, right? Yeah. We were all together, but it was a big tournament. So we've got some firsts here today. This is going to be exciting, and wow, you got a seat today, Mr. Andrew uh, Deluzio. Welcome on the fan cam. Man, you picked a good one to be here today. Thanks. I usually watch the show at work. I was so psyched to be able to get off and come. Nice. What do you do? I'm a security guard. Oh, good. That's not important. Nice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Someone's going to just steal something today. Uh, <laughs> no. I'm sure you took care of and put someone in your place. Uh, but no, I'm glad you could be here and watch it in real life. I'm, I'm going to come to you for help, so pay attention. It's about the arguments. You know how this goes. Yeah, I watch every week. All right. Well, do you want to show a, Do you have a favorite? Are you going to show your cards? Are you going to keep them to your vest? I'll keep it on the vest. Oh, oh, who's your favorite? Who's your favorite? Yeah, yeah. Let's put them on the hot a card? Let's give him a card. Why don't you write your favorite and then we'll yeah, reveal it good. at the end. That's a great idea. Yeah. We'll get you a card okay. and then we can reveal at the end who you think is going to win. Okay, Max, we make sure we get him a card before it's over. All right, good. All right, guys. Get the man a card. You, knows how this all, you know how this game works. We're going to do it. It's all passion, fast, creativity. Yep. Sebs. Wow, look, he's got the shirt. He's ready to go. Ready to go. The first La La Land mention is there. If you're playing at home and want a drink, sure probably a shot every time Mance brings up uh, La La Land or, or anybody game. from La La Land. <laughs> uh, all right, let's do this. Let's do this. Cue the music. What a lovely day! Are you not entertained? Let them fight. Ooh! All right, here we go. Round one. Aggressive. <laughs> uh, this came. Uh, this is one uh, based off the Mummy, which opened. Uh, mm -hmm. So opens Opening. this weekend. Opening. I've already seen it. Friday. June uh, 9th. Well, look, the reviews have not been kind. 
Uh, as Dan said, my favorite pun ever, you will not want to spend your sarcophagus. Sur <laughs> sarcophagus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I, so, yeah, it's kind of, it might be a wrap for the Dark Universe, and it hasn't uh, even started. Uh, uh, but we want to give it an injection. We want to do something good here. So we want you guys to pitch the actor and universal monster uh, that should join and could save this Dark Universe. What do we want to see next? What's a movie and a, what's a monster... And a, and a celebrity that can save this franchise and turn it into the right direction. Who do we want to see? Who's playing the monster? Wow. Uh, JTE, mm -hmm. you can pick from any of the Universal monster movies. Yeah, they go got, ahead. They got to save it already, huh? <laughs> That's not good news. Uh, I haven't seen the movie yet. Uh, I'm going to go with one of the best actors working today. And the reason why I did that is because. You look at that picture of all those actors, they're not going just for action. You're talking the cast You're talking with the cast John, of Dark yeah. Universe. Johnny Depp, Javier Bardem, Russell Crowe, Tom Cruise, Sofia Botella. Like, there's great actors there. Yes, they have a long history of being award winners, winning Oscars. So I want somebody that can walk into that room with that cast and hold his own. And for that, I'm going with Dracula, and I'm going Michael Fassbender. And the reason why I'm going Michael Fassbender is because this guy is probably one of the best actors working today by far, and I think he's even better when he's going evil. I mean, 12 Years a Slave, he reached another level of evil, which I think disturbed him. I love Magneto <laughs> because Magneto's character, you kind of understand where he's coming from. And you look at Bram Stoker's Dracula, one of the reasons why I love that movie is you kind of get where Vlad's coming from, Vlad the Impaler. Now, I took a picture there from Macbeth because I, he could play the old school Vlad with flashbacks, depending on how the director wants to do it. But I feel like he could also just come in and with those group of actors demand the scene. And Dracula, by far, the ones who were left in that list, that's who you need to cast next. That's your big one. I mean, Frankenstein, Wolfman, Dracula. Dracula is the top. He is the Iron Man of that franchise. Really? Dracula's more popular than The Mummy? I think he is. The Mummy is like the side character in all his own uh, movies. I, was a, I think you all picked one that's probably more yeah. popular than The Mummy. Uh, here we go, Mike, what Maybe are you picking? Maybe not me. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely not uh, you. Ladies and gentlemen, I have chosen uh, uh, the character of the Phantom of the Opera, which they've just <laughs> announced. No need to chuckle. Uh, the Phantom of the Opera will be in the Dark Universe, uh, and I think, look, let's think about the Phantom of the Opera. And of course, my favorite <laughs> version of him is the Andrew Lloyd Webber version uh, from the musical. Now, the Phantom of the Opera is a, a tortured man. He's disfigured, uh, but he is oddly alluring and, you know, strangely sexual. And he has a very unusual, unique, magnetic uh, charisma. So what actor fits all these things? You know, what actor is alluring? What what actor is oddly sexual and has a magnetic charisma? Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> there he is. Now imagine he has, I'm, I, in my version of the Phantom of the Opera, he has that half mask like in the Andrew L Lloyd Webber version. Uh, let's check some boxes, okay? Phantom of the Opera is a musician. He plays the piano. He composes music. Jeff Goldblum knows how to play the piano. I've seen him play at the Rockwell on Vermont in Los Angeles. Yeah, He's does. very mm -hmm. good. It's a very good show. Does he own the club? No. He just he just, okay. He's just there a lot. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't like when I'm watching a movie and I see they cut away to some other man's hands playing. That's going to be important. I want this guy <clears throat> to actually be able to play, you know, the organ or the piano. Get Ryan Gosling. Okay, it's take a drink, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to ignore that. Um, uh, look, so uh, in The Fly, we've seen that Goldblum can play a guy who's already, like, who's, you know, transforming into a monster or is already sort of disfigured. So we know he can do that turmoil. But on top of that, this is Jeff Goldblum. This is one of the weirdest, most fun, unique actors around. And he has not been in a big movie that people liked in a long time. I think this is somebody who, when paired with the right character and the right franchise, is going to be your Tony Stark, your Iron Man, <clears throat> somebody that can lead a franchise through multiple movies. All right. Jeff Man. <laughs> All right, listen. You want, you want someone. I want an actor who's going to, to be fresh. Someone who's going to really inject something fresh and fun and different into the Dark Universe. Clearly, that is what this series is going to need because the mummy looks too much like the other mummy. It felt too conventional formulaic. It felt like something we've seen before. So let's make this Dark Universe character something different, something we haven't seen. That is why I see Margot Robbie is... The wolf. Not the wolf man. Margot Robbie is the wolf. Like the Jack Nicholson, Michelle Pfeiffer wolf? Yeah, that's where no, I was no, going. No. Like, like uh, here's, okay, here's the pitch. <laughs> okay, so Margot Robbie plays Lizzie Talbot. 
She is a sexy, successful, ambitious wardrobe designer living in LA. She's really mean. She's really mean to the people that she works with and works for. She's kind of like Meryl Streep in The Devil Wears Prada. So she's all filming a film in uh, the English countryside. She goes into the woods looking for something for one of the costumes. She gets bit by a werewolf. Now she has the curse. She goes back to LA and there it is. She is she is nominated for an Academy Award for her previous film. She wins the award and when she goes up to collect it, it is a full moon oh in Hollywood. <laughs> And at the Academy Awards, in front of millions of people around the world, she turns into a werewolf, and everybody thinks it is a special effect, and it's a gag, but it's real. And throughout the course of the film, she learns to be a better person. She learns to open her heart. So she becomes she becomes a better person because of the werewolf curse. This is something that is going to be different. It is a mix. It is a mixture of action, comedy, and thrilling suspense, and a love story. A throwback to an American werewolf in London, but set in L.A. It's an American werewolf in London meets The Devil Wears Prada meets La La Land. Oh, Jesus. So, uh, so okay, I got we, it. Yeah, okay, so, good. Find it out. So she's going to become a better person through murdering a bunch of people? <laughs> I mean, she's I mean, going to become seems... a better person because she's she's got this curse and she doesn't know what to do with it, and it just shakes up our whole life. How does this tie into the like all these great actors in the universe? Like, how, okay, I, I, how's why, it t- how is she she turning to a werewolf on the Oscars? That sounds like a comedy. It sounds like she, epic movie or something. It, it is a comedy. It's a horror. It's movie. a comedy, <laughs> and it's a comedy. That's what okay. made an American world. An American world in London was great because it was a comedy, and it was great at being a horror movie. You're, That's what this. You're will pitching be, an the offbeat wolf. Wolfman movie that has nothing to do with this dark universe. I told dark. You Universe. I Your movie sounds very fun and light to me, not dark. And different, and something that this <laughs> franchise will need in order to stand it, it needs, out. But it needs to fit the franchise, and I don't think Margot Robbie has really had that great of a track record. She was not very good in Legend of Tarzan. She wasn't very good in Focus. I mean, Wolf of Wall Street's the only thing where I could really say, okay, that was a good performance, but I haven't seen the kind of range that would put her in this kind of movie. You know, these kind well, of look at the Wolf of Wall Street. She stole that's that movie what, from Leonardo DiCaprio. Movie. She didn't Were steal that from She stole that movie from Leonardo DiCaprio. There was not a literal wolf in Wolf of Wall Street. <laughs> She was yeah. already a wolf. Someone to go there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and Mike, I need you to yes. pitch me how the Phantom's going to work in this movie before you even give me, before you even get to Jeff Goldblum. Well, it's a movie What's about the Phantom of the movie? Opera. It's a movie about the Phantom how's of the he, Opera. But how's he? I can tell you the plot of Phantom of the Opera. How does he work with these the, the Wolfman Dracula? Like, what's he doing? Is he like just singing their theme yeah, music? Yeah. Can you connect them? How the is he going to connect eventually? You're saying when they team up? Yeah. In this dark universe. It's a dark universe. What's he doing? He's playing their theme music. It's the only thing I see him doing. Like. Don't, don't, don't. He certainly does play the theme music. Okay, that is a big part okay. of it. But he teams. He, he has. Look, he's a he's a sneak. He sneaks around. Oh, he sneaks around. Okay. He's a guy that can get into places. He's a guy that vanishes mysteriously. He's sort of a leader. He's an overseer. He's a Zordon type in this universe. He's not a guy maybe on the ground. Frankenstein is your brute force. You know, Dracula is, uh, you know, fighting. Guy, he has like he's wearing a cape. He has a mask on. Unless they're like. There's an action scene at like a play or a stage somewhere. I don't know how he's gonna come into this. His the universe. theater is the home the base. The theater is the home base. Yes. Okay, that's ridiculous. I mean, I don't want to switch see home base. Wait, the home base for the other monsters to come and like snack out. Yeah, like what's there's happening multiple there? home bases because they're obviously gonna have adventures all over the globe. <laughs> so there's caves, there's different places, and yes, his theater also in the bowels of the theater okay. is where he's sort of watching over all, all right, the well, stuff. I want goes all on. of you to connect because I all right, the interesting solo mm-hmm. films. Mm-hmm. But again, the question: Who How's do you want to join the the dark universe? Tell me how they're going to then eventually carry in. I, I get it, strong solo, yeah. but then how are they going to save this well, this franchise? That's Tell me how they interact or with Oda Monster. What, what else happens? Go ahead. The way I see Fassbender is, first of all, he is kind of like connect, connective tissue between all these people because he dates back before... Maybe not before the mummy, but all the way back before everybody else. And I think Russell Crowe's character. Now I haven't seen the movie, so we're just going on the actor. Well, how we think they actually fit into this universe. I just think with those actors and what Vassbender could bring to that role, I need somebody that I know could go in there and absolutely dominate the screen with some of the best working actors in Hollywood. And Dracula, I could see him starting off as maybe the bad guy because I mean these guys don't have a big bad. Again, I haven't seen mummy, but I don't know who the big bad is. All right, this guy could literally be the one. He could be their Thanos. Okay, here's the thing. First of all, both. Of you guys, all right, your picks are good, 
but they are too conventional. Michael Fassbender is a great actor, but yeah. Fassbender as Dracula, it's not different enough. It doesn't shake up the cinematic universe formula enough. Neither does Jeff Goldblum. I mean, Goldblum is not a conventional <laughs> choice. <laughs> it's not a conventional <laughs> choice, so. but it's not really a good choice either. He hasn't he's made great. a good movie in a while, and when he tries to, yes, with, with, hang on, with, with, with oh. the Independence Day Resurgence, that movie was awful, and people didn't really go see the movie, and he's certainly not a box office draw. Where Margot Robbie comes in as the wolf is if that if you have her part of this dark universe, you have the other members, Tom Cruise, the mummy, you have uh, uh, Russell Crowe, uh, uh, you know, Dr. Jekyll vying for her affection. So because you have a woman in the mix, it shakes up the gender dynamic. It throws some dramatic tension. It throws some love tension into the mix that you would not have with a male actor. And I got news for you. In The Wolf of Wall Street, okay, Margot Robbie may she didn't steal the movie, but she definitely held her own with Leonardo DiCaprio, and she can hold her own with Tom Cruise, and she can hold her own with Russell Crowe. And, by the way, guys, this will be the perfect follow follow-up for Margot Robbie after her smash box office hit, Miss Pac-Man. Okay, I thought you were about Mike, how are they connecting in your world? <laughs> Well, the the, the, fan, the Phantom of the Opera is the person that brings them all together. What? He is the one. What do you mean, what? He, if anything, he should be like Hawkeye. He should show up halfway through the movie and go away by the end of it. He can't lead his own He's film. He's like the Nick Fury. Oh, God. That's Russell Crowe. That's not Dan. That's We'd ever have Russell to Crow. debate which role seen the of the Avengers movie. would Phantom of the Opera <laughs> yeah. be. I'm just saying, like he's he does not deserve his own film. He does not deserve. There are been character. many films of the Phantom of the Opera. Yes, he does deserve his own film. I'm just saying that he has to. He is not going to take like a front of the line role in this. He is a backseat player, but he pops up, and when you see him, he's delightful. That's does what Goldblum does. Of course, he sings. <laughs> he's the Phantom okay. of the Opera. He's a brilliant musician. What, Goldblum is going to be peppered throughout a big heavy action movie, and you're going to be delighted by his scenes. He's going to break up things with some humor, with with relieving tension, like that. That's Goldblum. That's what you want from him. He's a fun side character. And but that's what he's in these movies. I, I, can't, I get that. Yeah, he's he, as, a, as an ensemble, he does add that to the mix. But what you have with Margot Robbie, I mean, again, it's an unconventional pick, but it's all about the argument. It's not, it's not always about the choice. It's about the argument. And what's going to happen with Margot Robbie is, like I said, she's going to shake up the dynamic. And as we saw last weekend with Wonder Woman, that shook up the dynamic. People are ready to see a strong female hero like Wonder Woman, like Margot Robbie as the wolf. You're going to bring out a strong female contingent of moviegoers that might not normally see a movie about the I'm, dark I'm universe. Not right, I'm using it as your final thoughts. Okay. Go ahead, final thoughts. I'm not against the fact that you want women to play the wolf man. I'm against the actress you picked. I don't think she's right for the role. I don't think she's proven enough that she can hold her own against those actors that they have cast so far. I feel like Mac Michael Fassbender walks in that room I don't care what movie it is. He stole the scene in Glorious Bastards. He literally just will go to the forefront, and he'll make me... I could just see Giant Depp and all these other actors, like, cower in a scene with him and feel like, that's Dracula. He's the one guy that walks in the room, everyone shuts up. And I think is one of the only actors working today with that crew that could actually deliver that kind of performance. Mike, okay. I, look, Margot Robbie's great. She could certainly hold her own as an actress, but I think the wolf, I don't know that that's exactly the right role for her. I think there's probably something else that she could do that could be a little bit better. And as far as Fassbender, I mean, yeah, he's a powerhouse. He's great. But it's a very dry casting of Dracula. My Dracula, I like Klaus Kinski. I like Bella Lugo. I like Gary Oldman. These are my Draculas. These are weird guys. These are guys that are going to bring this, like, really specific uniqueness to it. Uh, and that's what Goldblum will do with the Phantom. <laughs> I was seeing Goldblum at, while he played jazz. We were waiting in line for it, okay? And Goldblum showed up. And this is a true story. Goldblum, there was a line of people there to get in. He, for no reason, went up and down the line talking to everybody and, like, seducing them. Like, not literally, but like, ah, hello, hi, hello, how are you? Ah, it's so good to see you. And, like, no one knows him. And I was like, this is the most seductive man I've ever seen. This guy's incredible. He's going to bring that to this role. He's going to bring an incredibly unique spirit that Goldblum has. And it's going to give him a big hit that he deserves to have because he's amazing. He's a national treasure, for God's sake. You got your thoughts. I told oh, you. Ah, I should have touched on that. Dan Merle. Yes. Uh, well, The Fed of the Opera before being a musical was one of Universal's first monster movies back in uh, the early 20s with Lon Chaney, not Lon Chaney Jr., but Lon Chaney playing the Phantom. Uh, a lot of people uh, uh, kind of uh, 
Uh, chiming in online, Anthony Harrington says, Wesley Snipes as Blade as Dracula. <laughs> That's a good idea. Uh, David Bowman <laughs> yeah. says, Mads Mikkelsen would be an excellent Dracula. Anthony Hernandez says, Creature from the Black Lagoon, played by Andy Serkis, and practical <laughs> effects created Ooh. by Guillermo del Toro. That, that is a great capture. idea. That and, is a great uh, idea. Tom Zambino says, uh, Kevin Spacey's voice and presence would be great, even if you don't see his face as the Invisible Man. So a lot of... Uh, mm. a lot oh, of those are good choices. A lot of, oh, yeah. a lot of uh, good suggestions <laughs> coming Real in from choices. Twitter. Of course, great. we have the Twitter poll, which is out there. I'm looking at the results now. It's, I'd, I'd say that there's a, a leader, but we'll see what Andy rules. Mm. Uh, Andrew, what do you? Who, who, out of these three, what, what would you want to see? I'd want to see Fassbender as Dracula. I feel like he could take it to some pretty dark places, and that's where Dracula should be. All right. I mean, that's Thank where you, I, buddy. that's where my head was going. Just, I sort of agree. It's conventional. It's safe. I mean, look. Based on the arguments, I think JT wins. Fastbender makes the most sense, but my heart, man, my it's heart Goldblum. really wants to see Goldblum. Of course, <laughs> yeah. it's the best I answer mean, I have to any of the seeing questions seeing the today. film, uh, I, see, uh, I can't ask Dan for this advice. It's on cause, arguments because it's well, you haven't seen the film. I haven't. That's like, a problem. So, uh, None of us have. That, I haven't that's seen where it. things get go crazy because your 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 argument of well, these are actors in this film. Mm -hmm. They're not really actors in this movie. <laughs> well, we, we can't say that about Deb Javier Bardem or... Sure, if moving forward, we'll uh, yeah. see. They're, they're all there sort of chewing the scenery up a little bit. Yep. Uh, I can't go with my heart. i got to go with the argument. JT gets the point. Mm -hmm. There you go. You were close there. It's upsetting. It wasn't Margot, though. So, sorry. The, she... The, she get she turns up the Academy Awards. <laughs> Come on, yeah. Think how what? much fun yeah. that would be. I mean, she turns up the Academy yeah, Awards. What? Everybody, everybody thinks it's like, oh wow, what a great special, what a great <laughs> stunt. Okay. And no one Fair. knows except her. <laughs> that is real. Wait, that's but it. is she playing herself? <laughs> yeah, that's that's a kind of she's playing a kind wardrobe of, yeah. designer. She's playing like a wardrobe of? fashion oh, designer okay. who wins an Academy Award, but for, for, for whatever. I already said my Let's <laughs> <laughs> start that again. <laughs> All right. Round two. The wait, wait, wait. Hang on. Margot Robbie is Miss Pac-Man. Oh, oh, right. right. oh, sorry. What were the fan polls there, Dan? The fans agree with you. 47% uh, voted for Dracula Fassbender. 29% oh Phantom of the Gold Bloom. <laughs> 24% Margot Robbie Wolf. Thank you, 24%. You so. guys rock. <laughs> uh, let's go to one that we haven't had a chance to talk <clears> about. <throat> this is old news, but it's one that's been asked a ton. Mm. Um, Top Gun 2 announced! <laughs> Woohoo! Maverick! Pew, pew, highway to Top Gun 2! The need right. for speed. <laughs> um, so we want to know who should direct this movie. So mm. here we go, round two. Who should direct Top Gun 2? Uh, Tony Scott, we lost him. That was sad. He's a wonderful director. He can't come back to do this. So who takes the mantle to try and uh, make this film? Because there was this was a, the most Tony Scott movie you could make. Definitely. Um, so I want to know what your choices are. You're welcome to pitch some of what your movie would be. Uh, but tell us, uh, Mike, you're up first. Uh, okay, Top Gun is like a broy masterpiece. Okay, we need somebody who is in that mindset, somebody who understands that already and somebody who's going to deliver what we want from a Top Gun sequel. I'm talking Michael Bay, all right? Uh, if you want the intense action, if you want great shot of dude's abs, this is the guy. You want you want a guy who understands the bro movie, okay? <laughs> We're talking pain and game. We're talking bad boys. These are movies. He's not just a robot, man. He's a guy who can do other things, and he have. We've seen it, and those movies are good. People like those movies. Let, look, we can't get it exactly right. We can't give the same filmmaker. So we're going to get the next best thing. It's a guy who uh, who understands the mentality of these very aggressive dudes. All right, Mance. Okay. My pick for Top Gun Maverick, the director, is Justin Lin. Because what you're going to want is Fast and Furious in the air. And who better to do Fast and Furious in the air than the director of count them, four Fast and Furious movies. But what he did with Fast Five was not just direct another Fast and Furious movie. That movie changed the, changed the whole series. It changed the direction of the whole series. It infused a, a new life into it. It rejiggered it by making it fast, uh, fast and Furious meets Ocean's Eleven. So if there's anybody who's going to take an old film and do a sort of sequel slash reboot, make it fresh and different, it's going to be Justin Lin. He's great with action, and he's also great with strong character development. The way he established the characters 
in the Fast and Furious films that he did, especially Fast Five and Fast Six, it was all about family. And then look what he did with Star Trek Beyond. He put the series back on track quality-wise with Star Trek Beyond. It was a great action film, and the characters were fully realized and dynamic. You need fully realized and dynamic characters in an action film. Otherwise, who cares? This time, it is going to be since it's 30 years later and Maverick is 30 years older and he's past his prime, he's going to take it upon himself to train his young, hotshot, sexy, confident, irresistible protege, played by Emma Stone. (laughs) Emma Stone has incredible range. She has a toughness about her. She can hold her own with Tom Cruise. I think that if there's anybody who's going to play a young Maverick-style hotshot pilot, it's got to be Emma Stone. Is she Asian in this one? She's not Asian in this. (laughs) But she is about the the same age that Tom Cruise was in the original. Okay, got it. All right, JTE. All right, this was a hard question, and I went through a lot of choices, but I ultimately ended up with Shane Black. And here's the reason why. First of all, this guy came from the 80s. This guy wrote Predator, Lethal Weapon. He was around when Top Gun was in its prime. When that movie came out, he was already working in the industry. And this guy has proven that he knows how to do action with Iron Man 3. Now, I don't think it's a great MCU film, but I think it's a great Shane Black film. I think it was the wrong material for him. I think for him, it's all about dialogue, the characters, and adding a little bit of humor. And when I think Top Gun, yeah, those, the flying scenes are great. But some of my favorite scenes from Top Gun are the stuff like in the locker room, just the the guys interacting with each other, the competition Kilmer and Cruz just going after each other, and he knows how to write dialogue. He knows how to have that fun vibe, and I think he'll be able to make it more modern without losing all that 80s cheese. He'll, he'll touch on it. He'll even probably poke fun at it a little bit, and I think he would be a perfect choice because he's a director who's worked in both decades, and I think he's made that transition from a writer to a director, and he really knows how to do cool action scenes that kind of play against type. My thing is with Top Gun, I don't want to feel like an 80s Top Gun movie. I want to feel like a Top Gun movie for today. I feel like he would absolutely destroy it. I'll get more into the plot as we continue. All right, fight it out, guys. Uh, okay, Michael Bay from Mike, Justin Lin from Mance, GTA, Shane is a, Black. This is a two-way fight. Bay, get out of here. <laughs> yeah, no way. Bay, Bay is a good no, no, filmmaker, no, no, by I the way. I agree with JT because yeah. like, you don't want to make a Top Gun movie that's going to feel too much like the 80s Thank Top you. Gun. And I feel like Michael Bay is going to do that because, like you said, he's going to make the dudes with the abs. That's been done. you got to shake that up, and you got to make what? it current. And I don't think that he would he, – he's too – first of all, I think he's too sexist. I think he makes generally <laughs> – part of this. He makes <laughs> gen- no, no, no. <laughs> But no. no, I want Top Gun Maverick to be a great film. And Tom Cruise is going to need it after the moment. This is, is Top Gun we're yeah, talking listen, about. This isn't some amazing no, movie from the 80s. It's don't one under, of the best movies yeah, of the 80s. Don't underplay under... What? Top Gun actually has some sincere moments in the movie. When Goose dies, that's a sure, heartbreaking scene. Imagine if Michael Bay directed Top Gun 1 and did that scene. It'd be Pearl Harbor all over yeah, again. It would, it would be, just be flags waving, slow motion coming out of the water. I'm like, what am I watching right now? I'm not feeling anything. And the smaller moments in the movie Top Gun is when the characters are interacting, the scene at the bar where they're singing. There's actually charm. The, Michael Bay has the worst sense of humor of any action director I've ever seen. No, His humor is you, horrible. JT, I can't see him playing those small, fun moments at all, because they won't be small, fun moments. They'll be huge, dumb moments that are punching you in the face. Okay. Michael Bay would be horrible to direct this movie. People going to Top Gun want to see an 80s, something to the 80s. They're going to see no, no. some People new 2017 see, version of Top Gun that disagree. doesn't look like the 80s? They want That's see, crazy. They want to see a touch of the 80s. They, they, want, want, people, they want to see volleyball. People, they want to see oh, abs and volleyball. Ball and you, a handsome man. You That's what they that, want. You can do that in a smart way. A lot of people got news for you. They have not seen Top Gun, so they're going to need to go in to see Top Gun this Maverick. Is crazy. And it's got. I to, feel like I'm out of it. Has to appeal to people as a standalone <laughs> film. The only way you're going to do that is to sort of make it like a uh, a mentor protege type of film. Kind of like Tom Cruise and Paul Newman in The Color of Money, but again, I'm just using a very broad outline for that. This is about, uh, you know, this is about a man finding purpose and a woman finding her identity. And and you know what, uh, I agree with you. Shane Black is great with dialogue, but you know what, it's Top Gun. I'm not. It's not Inception. It's not. It's not even uh, uh, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. I want good action, and I want good characters, and I feel like Justin Lin has the perfect balance to bring it all to the table. All right, guys, good opening arguments here. I want to hear why yours, though, is the best for Top Gun specifically. Here's why. Let's go back. Here's why. Back to Justin Lin, because you want the perfect blend 
of action and you want the perfect blend of heart and good character. And I feel like Justin Lin really does have that. Michael Bay doesn't. I mean, everything of your argument is going back to the 80s. You want it to be for 2018 or 2019 when the movie comes out. So you're going to want something that feels current and fresh and stands on its own, does not rely too much on 80s nostalgia. And Justin Lin, what he did, again, with Fast Five and with Star Trek Beyond, putting both of those franchises back on track, making them fresh and vibrant and different is what Top Gun Maverick needs, and that's what it will get with him as a director. You, you look at peri- you look at uh, you look at Pain and Gain, which is like a period piece. It is a movie that is modern. Well, it is. I mean, it's not in modern day, but you take the characters out from that and put in Top Gun. What movie feels like Top Gun? That movie feels like it. The sunsets, the way he shoots things. That movie visually is going to remind you the most of Top Gun. There's no way that we want to see a Top Gun that strips itself of the fun cheesiness of the '80s. That is so much of a big part of it. We need to preserve that. Justin Lin, honestly, too much nuance. We don't want that much nuance. Shane Black, too much humor. We don't want this thing to be like winky winky. Isn't this a goofy movie? That's not going to work for this. We need a guy who like sincerely loves America. A guy who sincerely like understands what guys are like in the locker room. Like whether you agree, he, maybe you wouldn't be my best friend, but he's yeah. a guy that would understand this. He's my a guy head. that would be in the locker room with these guys. You could see Michael Bay like mad dogging other guys while they're shirtless in a locker room. He is he is yeah. these guy. He's well, these guys. Why, that's why you. That's why you want to put Emma Stone in the locker room too. Michael like, Bay is not the one guy I want to be friends with in the locker room. That I guy's didn't say like, I wanted to be friends a misogynist with him. pig in there probably. Exactly. Here's the deal, and let me talk a little bit about Justin Lin. The guy, when it comes to flying jets, it's all about speed, air, you know, physics. Yeah. He doesn't care about that. You see, knows there's a runway for about 18 miles. Cars are doing 16 flips like there's no gravity. Also, it took him two Fast and Furious movies before he finally made a good one with five. Tokyo Drift and Four are pretty. It's bad. Tokyo Drift is underrated. It's un- it's rated completely where no, it should it's be. An They're not very it's good movies. Decent. Also, Star Trek Beyond was not great. Yes, it was. I'm sorry. I know you're a Star Trek fan. No, no. I'll admit I was, Star Trek is good. I know good. a lot of people left that movie kind of underwhelmed. Like it just didn't quite hit. The, it felt like an episodic thing, which, which I understand what he went for, but I don't think it worked for that big movie franchise that they were See, going I for. I thought it did. Just a difference of opinion. I thought it did. But also, Shane Black, by the way, one of the best performances Val Kilmer has ever given was in Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Let's bring him back as Iceman with a guy who knows how to write for him and can make him just as crazy and nuts as he was in the first movie. There's already a working relationship there. And Tom Cruise doing Shane Black dialogue, Tom Cruise needs it after movies like Jack Reacher and The Mummy. He needs someone that knows how to write for him and can make him back to like a character that we actually care about. Like in Jerry Maguire, he needs a good script. I think Shane Black can bring that to him and the action, he knows how to shoot action so well now. Okay, if you want Tom Cruise to have a, a writer-director who writes for him well, bring in Christopher McQuarrie. He did a great job with him for Mission Impossible Rogue Nation and he also did touch-ups on... on you should have uh, picked him. Uh, yeah, why are you well, talking about McQuarrie? Yeah. I'm just saying, I'm just saying <laughs> if you're looking for a writer, if you're looking for a writer, yeah. Chris McQuarrie knows writer. how to write the director in one. But that's what, listen, first of all, to, in defense of Star Trek Beyond, he <laughs> no. didn't do that. <laughs> well. Go ahead, give your thoughts. Wait, wait, wait. These movies both these directors are good, but Michael Bay is the one who's going to understand Top Gun the most. I, you better. don't want, like, this winky, self-referential Top Gun. Like, that's not, we don't want, like, a Baywatch-style thing. And Justin Lin, honestly, Justin Lin is probably more of a guy I would hang out with. It doesn't make sense for him to, to direct this. <laughs> what's, that, what's, that, what's that have to do with anything? Because I'm not him. like the guys in Justin Top Gun. Lin, I'm the opposite t- of the guys in Top Gun. We need a guy who no, is like no, the I guys mean. in Top Gun. That's a guy who understands no, listen, that. If you take, if you put Fast Five on in the air, you've got Top Gun Maverick. It's no. about the speed. It's about you, you want you want a Top Gun movie that's going to feel even more visceral and more fun and more and more fast. And talk about the need for speed. Justin Lin will do that. And yeah, Fast Eight was ridiculous, but he didn't direct that. He did and yeah, six. the first, but five and six were the best ones. But they're, they're too ridiculous. It doesn't fit for it's, Top Gun. Top Gun's ridiculous because Top of Gun aesthetic. is ridiculous. It's because of certain situations, not because of the planes are doing 360s. Top Gun is ridiculous. And, Let's be clear. Top Gun is ridiculous. Yes, it, it is, is ridiculous. The top. It's ridic- that's, thank you. Thank you. It, it is, is ridiculous. ridiculous. That's, that's the point that, I'm trying to make. So he was back in the 80s. Oh, and now we're going to gonna strip it away. We're going to make Top Gun. We're going to ground it in reality and make it look nothing like the old movie. That's why Shane Black is actually not a good director. He's too sophisticated for Top Gun. Are you kidding me? Justin Lin is also too sophisticated for Top Gun. Justin Lin is not sophisticated. Shane Black is the perfect He's directed Community. He has a comedy background. 
around. He's you very good action. at a multiple of <laughs> You want action, you want heart, you want humor. Justin Lin yeah. is the real Shane deal. Shane Black's next film is Predator. He's not too classy to make Top Gun. This guy is perfect for making 80s movies for today. You haven't seen Predator Michael yet. Michael Bay is going to shoot with the, crazy, like the, the newest red camera. It's going to look great. It's going to look sexy, but it's going to have Listen, maybe a color palette that reminds you of the 80s. There's no way his movie's going to look any, crappy in 2017. Any director can shoot a golden hour. That's the only reason why I think you want Bay is because you want those golden hour of shots. Of course I sunset. want. He, nobody Anybody shoots golden hour that. like Michael Bay. Tony Scott He's did Mr. it before golden him. hour. They Tony, should call him that. No, Tony Scott did it before him in Days of Thunder and Top Gun before Bay was even doing it. All right, he All right. was. Oh, he used to be Mr. Golden Hour, and now Michael Bay is <laughs> Mr. Right. Golden Hour. Final thoughts here. Okay, final thoughts. Hold here. on. Just Okay, yes. here you go. I'm just motivating us. Do you want us to right, pitch yeah. our movie? Who remakes who, that song? Who? This is what we want. This is it. You, everyone knows this track. Mm -hmm. Sell the me. Top Gun 2. Speed. Kenny Top. Loggins. Danger mm -hmm. Zone. How is your director taking us to Danger so Zone? You want the need for speed? Who does speed better than Justin Lin? Look, he did four freaking car movies. He could do a fighter jet movie. It'll it'll be like a, a breath of fresh air for him to put cars in the air and go even faster. You want the need for speed? He's your guy. Okay, you, you you want you want you don't want a winky. You want a guy who's going to take it as seriously as the first movie does. You want look if Justin Lin and Shane Black they walk into a room and Top Gun is on and it's the volleyball scene. I bet both of them would like chuck a little bit. Oh, that's that's kind of a cheesy. Michael Bay walks in the room, and goes, "Hell yeah, great scene." That's a great scene in a great movie. That's the guy I want directing it. I'm not. This is the I, this it's is the most right I've ever been. Uh, you want Michael Bay to remake Top Gun. I want Shane Black to do what That's Ryan Coogler did with Creed. I want him to make it for modern times, but still make it cool and still give you remind you of the original films that made it, you love it in the first place. I feel like Shane Black could do the same thing Ryan Coogler did with Creed. I think he could update it, but he was around in the so 80s, he was around Ryan in the 90s. Cooper. No, I think <laughs> Shane Black's better. He's worked with Kilmer. He's a, he's a screen, great screenwriter, and I think he can get the smaller moments off the, out of the sky that are more important to me than in the sky. All right, Dan, anything to clean up there? Whew. Wow. Uh, so, uh, uh, where does he even start? Uh, no. <laughs> I know. I was actually just kind of sucked into that conversation. Uh, right now, for the record, Tron Legacy and Oblivion director Joseph yep. Kaczynski is rumored to be considering the movie. Mm -hmm. Obviously, mm -hmm. the Tom Cruise connection with Oblivion there. Um, mm -hmm. Scott, you mentioned that uh, Tom Cruise and Emma Stone are about the same age when uh, both Top Gun... Like four years apart? Uh, about like four years apart, yeah. Tom Cruise is about 34 when Top Gun came out. Emma Stone would probably be about 30. So, you know, roughly the same age. And uh, we have our Twitter poll, which, Andy, once you make your ruling, I will share with you the results of that. <laughs> One of you really connected with me here. Uh -oh. <laughs> oh, i got to be honest. One of you really showed me the passion. <sighs> One of you truly took my breath away. I think it was me. It wasn't you, JT. <laughs> you even got distracted saying Ryan Coogler. <laughs> no, <it was> <laughs> I got distracted saying Christopher McQuarrie. There is one man who knows how to do this, and I saw the passion, the creativity. Mike Carlson for the Thank win. Thank you. Thank you. That was uh, some brilliant fighting stuff. I didn't there. know I cared about that until just now. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know, but now I, I, I care. You yeah. want the man who's going to uh. watch that scene and say, yeah! Uh. Yes, that's 100% true. He's gonna uh, go. All right, yes. you got uh, it. you're on the board. Strangely, uh, Shane Black took the audience's breath away. 44% vote for Shane Easily. Black in the fan poll. 31% Justin Lin, only 25% Michael Bay, although I would agree with you, Andy. Based on the arguments, Mike's passion, <laughs> and the fact that he, <laughs> I, I legitimately worldly. believe that you thought that you had never been more right than you were about <laughs> yes. this. Yes. Passion won so, the argument. I, uh, in defense of <laughs> Star Trek Beyond. Shut up! <laughs> <laughs> no, I love you. Shut up. Uh, <laughs> as I say, shut up with love. Uh, round uh, three. All right. Well, this is where things are going to take a bit of a turn. As oh, say. No question about we it. We were trying something new this fight. This is a championship fight. We wanted to try something here and try it out. Uh, this will be called an advantage round. That's right. For the next three rounds, we have Taylor fit a question to your strengths. You got to choose the question, and you got to have first choice. So... Mike Carlson, you have the first advantage round. Right. Now let me be clear, because what you don't know is if you win your advantage round, mm -hmm. Mike, you will earn a regular point. However, if Scott or JTE win this round, they will win double points. Whoa. Whoa. So if the contestant wins one. against hey. the advantage and goes Ooh. against the advantage and, and takes down their opponent who had the advantage Damn. this round, okay. you will earn double points. Interesting. Ooh. Do you guys understand how this yeah, will work? Yeah, I do. Yes. Yeah, All right. Like so you it. each had the advantage. Really shake it up. Shake it up. Shake it up. Double jeopardy. Let's do it. 
<laughs> All right, so Mike, you have the advantage. This is yours to lose. Uh, tell us, why don't you tell us what your question is? Uh, what's the phrasing? Can I see it? <laughs> <laughs> A Mike Carlson advantage round. The question is, what movie character would open the best chain restaurant? All right, Mike, you get to go and first. I get to go first. All right. To start a success, success uh, to start a successful business, you need a lot of capital. Okay, that's number one. I'm I've chosen one of the richest boys in the entire world, if not the richest boy. I'm talking about Richie Rich. Okay, this is a guy. Larry is. We all remember the iconic. <laughs> no, we don't. Movie Richie Rich. <laughs> I yes. do. <laughs> all right. Look, here's the thing. With a chain restaurant. <laughs> You need a simple menu. People don't want some fancy, you know, like East Coast, West Coast sort of uh, liberally food. They want cheeseburgers. They want grilled cheese. They want stuff that everyone eats. A kid has the perfect palate for that. A kid loves food like that. So Richie's going to be perfect at tasting and figuring out a menu. Now, the Rich family also employs some of the best chefs in the world because they're very rich and that's what rich people do. So they're going to curate an incredible menu, all right? Now, chain restaurants need a simple system of shipping and freezing meat and different things that rolls bread to get to the to get to the extra restaurant. Richie Richie uh, R- uh, that's Richie a person Rich. I know. <laughs> Richie, Richie Rich uh, has a friend named <laughs> Professor Keenbean. <laughs> Professor Keenbean is the world's greatest scientist. He has developed a system for freezing and storing and transporting meat that is going to save everyone a ton of money when it comes to this. So this restaurant is going to be so is successful. He in a movie? Of course. Oh, okay. I'm just curious. Professor Keenbean was the guy who blew the whole sc- the, the scandal sorry, wide open sorry, when the John Larry Kit character was trying to kill his yeah, parents on, and take over I the whole company. I don't remember this, this movie This is Richie at all. Rich, the movie that we all remember. Of course. Come on. Sorry, I apologize. All right. I'm I'm only about 10% into my pitch. <laughs> oh, God. Um, all right. So Professor Keenbean has come up with these systems of cooking and transporting, and it's going to be amazing because it's going to save so much money. Now you're thinking, okay, what does the theming look like? Because a chain restaurant needs to have a theme. For sure. Here's the thing. It looks just like a TGI Fridays because that's what people like. So it's TGI Fridays. No, 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 it's not. It looks similar to a TGI, but it looks nicer. It's a TGI Fridays, but it looks nicer. It's not the same thing, but that's what people like. People like a bunch of crap on the walls, but the crap is slightly. Oh, suitcases, uh, uh, alligators, uh, like stuffed alligators. That sounds like a Fridays. Uh, Yeah, but it's better. They're better like quality toys and stuff on the wall. better quality suitcases. Right. Now here, Here's the kicker. Here's the thing that is really going to separate this from a normal Fridays or a Chili's or something. Because he's a little kid, there's going to be a play area. There's going to be a McDonald's Land play place type of a thing. And Richie has some pretty great friends from the Harvey Comics universe. So we're going to have different rides and stuff that are themed to his friends, you know. So there'll be like, you know, a Hot Stuff the Little Devil ball pit. There's going to be, a, you know, a little dot slide. There's going to be a Casper slide, which is also a pun, which is very fun because that's a song that people like. There are going to be, you know, statues and fun ideas and and all. Like we're going to talk, we're going to talk about Richie's other friends, like Little Lotta and Spooky, the tough enough little ghost. He's going to have a, a, a drawing easel where kids are going to have fun. This is going to be the ultimate chain restaurant. It's got something for kids. It's got something for adults, and you're going to get meals that are dependable and delicious. And they're going to save so much money because of Professor Keen Bean's innovations as far Who's as restaurants Who's saving the money, the consumer or the restaurateur? The restaurateur. <laughs> okay. So he's not passing the savings yeah. on to the to No, the it's the same. It costs the same what's as a normal the, Friday. What's the name of the restaurant? Uh, Richie Rich's Family Restaurant. Okay. Okay. Uh, great. Good start. And good, good use of your advantage there, Mike. Thank you. Mance, you're up next. Okay. You want a, a character from a film. Best known for a film to open up a chain. One of the greatest film characters, even though he started off in a book, he's better known for the film. One of the greatest movies of all time is The Godfather. The Godfather about an Italian family's rise to power. Vito Corleone's Italian restaurant. Vito's Ooh. Italian restaurant. Talk about an offer you can't refuse. <laughs> he already has the olive oil business down. He's got capital. He's very rich. But this is a place you go to where you were treated with respect. You are treated like a real godfather. They'll, you'll, 
You'll love the meal so much that you'll try to get out, and they'll keep pulling it back in. <laughs> the food is Wait, that good. Leave. Leave. Oh, okay. That sounds scary. Yeah. Listen, and you know, you'll leave the guns, you'll take the cannoli. And but guess what? Try the veal. It's the best in town. Vito's Italian restaurant. You think Italian, you think pasta, you think lasagna, you think pizza. This is a classy restaurant. It is a chain. It is above the other chains like Burger King and Roy Rogers and McDonald's. It is class and it is Italian and it's the Don. It's an offer. Where you do you put it on use. the chain next to like Buca di Peppo? Yeah. It's above Buca it di Peppo. Buca? It's okay. more affordable than Buca di Peppo. Wait, Maggiano's wait. level? It's, it's even greater. It's it's it's, it's it's the Godfather. Okay. So it is the top. Pricing? Are the, are the menu Very ribs affordable. Similar to Maggiano's uh, chilies? It's similar to like uh, uh, Olive Garden. <laughs> okay. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So it's affordable. I mean, you want, <laughs> if it's going to be a chain, it has to be affordable. Okay. So we're <laughs> talking Italian level food. Real Italian Olive, level. But it's Olive Garden quality. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, it's Olive Garden <laughs> cost. Wait, it's oh, okay, Olive Garden okay. pricing. That's okay, the okay. difference. But it's much better quality. Nobody is more qualified to make quality So you are Italian passing food. on the savings, maybe to the detriment of the business. Got it. Got <laughs> yeah. it. Uh, <laughs> JT, go ahead. Uh, I'm going with a character that actually is popular, <laughs> and hmm. I think everybody oh, yeah, knows. Godfather's a popular. From, from, oh, yeah, like I'm sure like 15 year olds are like, take me the Corleones. Mm -hmm. No, they're not. They're gonna want to go to Deadpool's Chimmy F and Changas. Okay, this guy is already. He's all. Look at this picture. He's already endorsing it in his movie trailers. All the guy do is I open. I think that's a Photoshop. That is not Photoshop. I took that photo myself. <laughs> okay. Right <laughs> there on live. You photographed it yourself. There. I took it myself. I don't believe <laughs> that. There's several photos of him with chimichangas. I I feel like if you're gonna have a franchise be successful today, it can't just look like TGIF. It can't just go off one little property. It has to go off something that is universally big right now. And Deadpool is by far one of the most popular comic book characters. Hands down right now, it made more money than every X-Men movie and almost every MCU film outside the Avengers. He's just so ingrained into pop culture that this restaurant, as soon as you step in, you feel like you're in Deadpool. There's Colossus, sh Classic Shakes? Colossus? Shakes? Did I say that right? Colossus, Colossus. Shakes. Colossus. Yeah. 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 There's, there's a hot sauce called a Teenage Warhead Hot Sauce. Like, everything is themed to the mm -hmm. movie. You go in there and... I, you remember that restaurant Dick's where everyone treats you kind of like yeah. Dick's Last yeah. Resort. Yeah, yeah. Dick's yeah. Last Resort. Every single waiter is dressed like Deadpool and he's giving you a hard time. Oh, Jesus he's, Christ. He's, he's, <laughs> no, it, listen, you're signing up for that when you go in, though, just like Dick's Last Resort. You, you know that going in. You're going to get that repertoire. So there's like five Deadpools walking around. Oh, yeah, there's That's like all. six of them, which yeah. is like any other Comic Con. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so they're all dressed up like that. They're Ooh. all giving you attitude. They're all, and it's fun. It's almost like interactive uh, dinner theater. Like you get to go there and actually be part of Deadpool. I think it'd be fantastic. Do they, do Deadpools interact with each other and do shows or anything? They don't really interact with each other, but there is a TV in the bar at all times playing Deadpool. So it's just on loop, like it's far, on, like, it's like on, uh, Bubba Gump. Exactly, it just Gump it's on, on loop, loop okay. and once an hour they play the Honest Trailer Deadpool. Oh, okay, great. Dirt. What's the pricing years, as I asked there? Uh, it, what, well, the where would you is, rate it next to another restaurant? I would put it like Chipotle level. Oh, okay. Yeah, not too expensive. So, and they're quick. It's not something you have to sit down all the time and spend the whole so, time. So you can it's go like in cafeteria there. style with them. They're behind the counter no, then? No, it's not. I'm saying food quality-wise is around Chipotle style, but there actually is a guy's... Deadpool comes up to you and he's like, here, what do you want? You point to it, he but writes it down, he brings it back. It's not the real Deadpool, though. No. It's, it's some they're, San Diego college students. <laughs> guys, here's where you're both wrong. <laughs> First of all, Richie Rich is not really known as oh, a my God. movie character. He is what? a comic yes, character. He's you. a cartoon. He's just not like a movie character. Deadpool, a movie. Deadpool had a hit movie. Okay, great film. I love the Deadpool. Mm -hmm. But who knows what the sequel's going to do? Uh, who knows when the sequel's going to come out? What, could it could it fall prey to like what Iron Man two and Avengers two and and Guardians two? Where the he, sequels but he has good? a life but, outside but of the movies. No, but he is a he has a life based because he's a comic book character. Mm -hmm. He's better known still, even though the movie was great. He's better known as a comic book character. And yes, Vito Corleone got his start as a book written by Mario Puzo, but he's better known. <laughs> he's better known as a movie character. That is the question. What movie character would open the best. I just he don't see better any... known as a movie character. And here's the thing. You've got waiters and waitresses dressed to the hill. They're going to make even kids feel like grown-ups. Yeah. And The Godfather is timeless. So Vito's Italian restaurant will also be timeless. Well, now, hang on. Uh, uh, Deadpool's uh, ch Chimingadas, whatever. Chimichangas. Well, it'll, it'll, 
<laughs> it's a flash in the pan. Yeah. It'll be here today, gone tomorrow. Oh, what? Are you kidding me? That, Chipotle no is a huge success. The, the no Deadpool way. thing. There's going to be 20 college yeah, students dressed as Deadpool, Deadpool, Deadpool trying to make jokes. No. This is the biggest nightmare of all time. No, no, Deadpool no, no. himself is, would not be involved with it all. He's not going to show up to a business yeah, meeting, a first of all. That's the thing. Just get the comic book people. Ryan Reynolds shows up once in a while, puts on the suit, and you don't even know it's him. You don't find out. Ryan Reynolds. Wait, wait. We're in the reality of the. This is the reality is all skewed here. I'm talking about the real Richie Rich opening up a restaurant, not the Ryan Reynolds. Do so you see that picture that Richie Rich put up there? He looks like a little Trump. I don't want to go to a restaurant. He's, he's a, little Trump. a little Trump. Trump, Trump has him. restaurants. Right, right, put I the Godfather up there. Guy? Put the Godfather up there. Like, let's, let's put the Don Corleone. There you go. See that I, would buy, I, I would see buy. I would see that buy, movie. Richie Rich. I, no, no, wait. <laughs> I would buy yeah. chicken parmesan and I would take okay, the cannoli from that guy. Okay, first of all, you're going to be in this restaurant there's going to be like like the, like the some crime family is going to be sitting next to you and you're going to see him and you're like, honey, does that guy have a gun on him? And you're going to be like, oh my God, they're, they're going to shake down owners. They're going to be, cra- it's going to be a nightmare. Why would you ever go to this Wait, restaurant? Well, you said it yourself. You said you want capital, you want a simple menu, you want someone who's rich. And no crime. And, Italian and food is not Vito's simple. Ita- Italian food is right. simple. You know what you think, what do you think when you hear Italian you food? You forget your wallet or something. I don't, this they're going to beat you in the look, street like Sonny did. This is maybe unfair, but I looked at Yelp and Andy, would you read, <laughs> read what I found here? Oh, okay, here we this? go. Oh. Vito Corleone, Italian grill. Oh, what does it say at the top of it though? Four stars. What does it say at the top? Reviews. What does it say at the top, though? Yelpers report this location has closed. 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 Stuffed pork. T- but it did have That's, a 24 four-star rating average. Yeah, but it closed Vito because Corleone. something bad happened. Oh, wait a minute. That was not the Vito Corleone. How I don't know. How do we know? Didn't say it closed. How do we know? I do <laughs> Nobody, no, wow. ki- no kids. This is, this is the Comey wow. trial. Yeah, 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 smoking go. gun. No kids. I'm a simple man rich. like a, like James Where Corleone. was that restaurant? Where was the restaurant? That Ohio. 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 There you go. You start in New York I'm and you build the chain from you there. Can't, I'm just no, saying it's not sustainable in Ohio. Even Ohio. with good food, it's not sustainable in Ohio. And it's, but Richie Rich isn't sustainable yeah. anywhere. Who I have cares about Richie Rich? Rich. It he's doesn't not, matter. His quality of food movie. and the fun, the children. The children are the ones who are going to drive this the business. Movie, the, the question is movie character. Richie no, Rich it's is not. not it's a, a restaurant character. question. Well, it's what movie character. It's your question for yes. the record. <laughs> 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 I know. What movie character would open the, would open the best chain well, but restaurant? But I'm saying it's not so, movie character on. specific. I got to clarify because, you know, look, this is your question, so I'm challenging you, sir. That's fair. A chain restaurant has multiple locations. Of course. And to be able to be a startup in mm-hmm. any city right. and be successful. So in your final closings as we go through, Mike, you'll start us. Why is it the best chain restaurant? How many how many of these I, can you can we make? We can make a lot of them. And as I said before, the costs of opening it and storing and shipping meat, specifically because this is a chain restaurant, are going to be brought down. So it's going to be a more profitable uh, profitable business for people to invest in, for other people to get excited about, because it's so much cheaper than a normal chain restaurant. You want to be able to ship things out across Across the globe and make it cheap. That's the number one reason. The second is, of course, the fun stuff, the slide, the ball pit, and the uh, the the very simple but very delicious food. All right. Okay. Man's final thoughts. Everybody, everybody respects the Don. <laughs> everybody respects the Corleone family. The Corleone family is going to be able to keep costs down because of the respect, because oh, of the favors they they're doing do bad for each other. The they're doing things for each other. Who knows what they're doing? <laughs> but here's the thing, guys. Everybody loves Italian. Okay, look at the success of Olive Garden and Bucca di Peppo. Then you bring in a famous movie character. Yeah, he's the mob. The <laughs> Corio family is the mob. But he's the mob. But Bucca di is a mob. Is, too, right? <laughs> but but you're talking about a character that everybody loves. A movie character that everybody loves. He's one of the greatest movie characters of all time. Look it up on the AFI list, Dan Miro. I'm sure he is on there. These other two characters are not. And he's Italian, and everybody loves Italian. <laughs> All right. Uh, All right. Going for the more uh, powerful <laughs> character. All right. Let's hear about Deadpool. Here's the thing. The most important thing when you're opening a franchise, like a new restaurant, is advertising. And no one has proved who's better at advertising than Deadpool. His movie alone, I think the success of that movie is really because he's so involved in every aspect of advertising. You're going to watch TV. You're going to be watching NBA playoffs. <laughs> and he, Deadpool's going to come out. He's going to make you laugh. He's going to show chimichangas. He's going to be around his restaurant throwing knives into the wall. It's going to be whoa, so entertaining. Whoa, whoa. Yeah, because he's, he's a nice specialist. He's got swords. He's going to be cutting chip joggers with swords. The kids and the family are going to be like, that's where we want to go. Are you sure you don't want to go to Richie Rich? Kids are going to say, who? They're going to say, you sure you don't want to go to Vito Corleone? They're like, Dad, I have no idea what you're talking about, but let's go to Deadpool because that guy looks entertaining. It looks fun. And it's an experience. And look at all those chimichangas. 
Whew. All right, Dan, what's <laughs> on the board? There's so much to go into. Uh, 19, uh, Richie Rich was, uh, was Macaulay Culkin's last movie until 2003. The movie Oof. came out in 1994, so that was the last of the uh, young Culkin uh, filmography. Professor Keen Bean in that movie was played by Michael McShane. You might know him as the hypnotist from Office Space, amongst many other roles. Mm -hmm. uh, Manch, you went very obscure, obscure with your Godfather quote. You, you didn't quite get it right. You said, try the veal, it's the best in town. Try the veal, it's the best in the city is actually the God for the quote from the God. But I had points for obscurity. Um, I'm surprised nobody made a reference to the fact that everyone, would, no one would want to go to the bathroom in Scott's restaurant. <laughs> I was, uh, yeah, was going to say that. Yeah, uh, there's probably a gun under your toilet. You guys also kept referencing Buca de Peppo. If we're ever going to get up on the Meatball Wall of Fame, it's, it's Buca de Peppo. <laughs> yeah, we want to make sure we get the name right for Spencer's sake, yes. so we can get us on that Meatball Wall of Fame. Uh, JTE, I appreciate the on, the shameless pandering by saying that the honest trailer would play in the Deadpool. I restaurant. mean, why not? It's fantastic. It and, and because it was broached, uh, I I do have to say factually, the Trump Organization's website does list six restaurants that are owned and operated by uh, that, that little venerable Trump, organization. Little Trump, what's his name? So yes, the, the Richie Rich could potentially, I guess, join the little Trump? the Donald and mm -hmm. the restaurant business. He looks like him. All right, based on those arguments. Yeah, what was weird to me is JTE. You're, there's, he's chopping up chimichangas with swords. Oh, in the commercials. Everything. In the commercials. Uh, Just you know, like wow. he does everything. Going for the experience. Yeah, I, I don't. You didn't sell me on the food and a bunch of like disgruntled peep and people in Deadpool costumes walking around. <laughs> Giving me chimichangas sounds kind of gross. Uh, okay. So I don't know if I'm all yelling at me. Maybe for once, but chain restaurant to live, you got to go back multiple times. So yeah, I respect your budget. Uh, there, <laughs> Mike and good. Mance it came down to, but Mike, you were like, oh, well, look at all this fun. There'll be so many statues and drawing easels. <laughs> the I, point out. I said ball pit and slide as well. <laughs> your list of things and all the obscure uh, Harvey characters. Yeah, I great just, characters. Oh, man, you went on a weird direction there. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, Mance, you lost me a little bit with the pricing. I mean, how are they going to make a business <laughs> with <laughs> losing money? Uh, hand over fist. Uh, mm -hmm. That said, where would I rather eat? Strangely enough, I think I'd probably want to go to the Godfather restaurant. Mm -hmm. I think a couple more more mm. often there. Yeah, I heard a little bit more about the food and the <sighs> you're going to be treated classy and the kids can even. That just sounds like a fun thing. Richie Rich, I don't, I don't. Why is it a Friday? Because <laughs> people love Fridays. <laughs> people love Fridays. I just got a little confused. Uh, it sounded like theme park food then at that point, and then I'd rather get a nice Italian meal. So Mance. You get the two win, points. but you get two points because wow. you beat Mike on his wow. swing in the advantage round. Right. Last to first. Now Mance yeah, takes right. the lead. Right. 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 Vito Corleone's Italian was the second place uh, runner up in the. Uh, what was the first? Voter poll. 37% voted for Vito Corleone. 47% voted for Deadpool's Jimmy Chongas. I Chongas. won every poll so far. 16% voted for yeah. T.G.I. Ritchie's. I'm surprised. T.G.I. Ritchie's. <laughs> all right, well, Mike, here's your chance to win, because if you win any of these next advantage rounds, you will get two points, all right? Yeah, JTE, sure, yeah. it's your turn for the advantage. Would you like to read your question? Sure, throw it out there, but I already know what it is. What Stallone character, again, outside of Rocky and Rambo, would win an all-out battle royale? Yes, now we took out Rocky and Rambo just because we thought that would be unfair. Yeah. Those are the two obvious choices I, I think everyone would take. Yep. But Stallone's done a lot out of characters. Oh, a whole bunch. So this is a fun one. Who would win in a Stallone battle royale? JTE, who are you picking? Oh, the question I've been waiting for my whole life. Oh. Um, <laughs> I've been studying for this since day one, guys. It's got to be go. It's got to be Cobra, uh, also known as Marion Cabretti. The guy just gets results, and I think that's why I chose him out of all the other characters he plays. He is part of something called the Zombie Squad. I, to this day, don't know what that is, but it sounds amazingly badass. It's so badass that no one else on the force even knows what it is, to the point where they have a guy surrounded in a grocery store. They're like, calling the zombie squad. You would think a whole truck of people would come up. One guy. One guy walks out. It's Stallone, glasses, match. Uh, and the way he walks in and casually, he's not even, like, scared for a millisecond throughout this entire movie. He is the law to a degree yeah, that has uh, never seen before. I but, am the law. But, yeah, that's true. <laughs> but he's not restrained by the law. And I think that's what makes him better than any of the other Sloan characters because, like it or not, they're all kind of... They have some sort of moral code as far as like where they're standing in the police print stink, and they have something that's holding the back. Cobra's the one guy of all the Stallone characters, which no matter what he's put up against, defeats it easily. It's not. It's very rare that you see a challenge throughout this entire movie. Even guys that are like double his height, muscle range, and everything. He, Cobra just absolutely dominates him. And I got more stuff I'm gonna throw at you, but I'm gonna let you guys get yours. All right, first. Mike, which Stallone character are you picking? Well, um. 
I'm going with another iconic character, uh, <laughs> John Spartan from Demolition Man. Mm. Uh, look, this guy was in cryo prison for 34 years. Uh, that is a crazy amount of time to be in a regular prison, let alone a cryo prison. This guy is tough as nails. He is a he, he was frozen in 1996, so he has the experience of an old way of policing, and then he's unfrozen years later to, of course, uh, capture Simon Phoenix, uh, his arch nemesis, and the scariest criminal of all time, the scariest criminal on the planet. This guy has experience. He works within the law. He understands fighting, hand-to-hand -hand combat, but he has a code of ethics. And also, he eats a lot of Taco Bell. <laughs> he does eat a lot of Taco Bell. And Taco Bell is maybe the greatest food of all time. So I want a guy who is going to stand. He's going to have rules. He is going to you know, play by a book. Somebody who's a loose cannon who doesn't uh, uh, respect law, I think, is dangerous to himself. Not to others. Scott. All right, guys. Great picks. I'm going with Barney Ross from The Expendables. Wait. Make that three Expendables movies that came out in 2010, 2012, and 2014. Which movie are you going to pick from? Okay, one, two, I'm or three? Go, well, I'm going to go with uh, the... F which one had Stallone? Uh, all which three. one had the... Uh, all three. All of them. All of them. The first one. Arnold. No. Arnold. 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 Arnold was which also Expendable? You're, you're picking Stallone from Expendables, but Expendables 1, 2, or 3? Oh, Expendables 1. Okay, good. I okay. mean, Expendables 1. Okay, first of all, you're talking about a mercenary. A mercenary, a leader of mercenaries. A leader who can who can lead someone like like uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Jason Statham, Jess, Jet Li. I mean, you're talking about someone who has power around the world, not just in the USA. Listen, I love uh, Demotion Man, but I feel like it's more of a comedy. It's a fish out of water comedy. So that's out. That's not a strong character. Cobra, great film, but it's very dated, very 80s. It's very cheesy. We're not talking about movies. I think badass. I think Barney Ross from Expendables. Here's a guy who is a badass, and he's leading badasses. Can I start turning these down? <laughs> All Good right. luck. Take your best shot. Uh, first things first, uh, let's start with Barney Ross. He's old. He's in his twilight. And those movies really are all about the fact that he can't do these things without his team. Like, that mercenary team is what makes Barney Ross Barney Ross. The only time he ever goes solo in the films, he usually loses and has to go back to his friends for help. And he realizes, oh, I'm only as good as my team is. Barney Ross, he's, he's good, but he's, again, he's in his twilight years. He's not in his prime. You want Stallone in his prime if he's going to be going into Battle Royale. There's scenes in Expendables 1 where he's running, and I'm, I was like, Stallone looks like he's lost a step or two. Like, he looks like he might trip any second because he's just not at the right age. He's not in his prime. John Spartan, first of all, he has a chip in his head which could make him do things. He can't be around, like, he wants to knit every time he sees anything like a sweater. Like, there's going to be things in his brain that aren't going to really help him connect too much when it comes to actual fighting. And the only reason why Simon Phoenix is good is because he's also programmed to be, like, a special super martial artist. And honestly, most of Demolition Man, he gets his ass kicked by Wesley Snipes. Once he gets unfrozen, he's just getting his ass kicked left and right. And here's one thing Cobra does that these two guys don't. Cobra has those great 80 one-liners, but every time he uses one, it's only to distract or you know, maybe th make the guy think, mainly in the beginning when a guy has a hostage, he uses it to distract the guy and buy him some time. He's never given those one-liners as he's about to shoot somebody. One of the biggest issues with John Spartan, every time he's about to either lay a blow on Wesley Snipes or take a shot at him, he's like, no, you're going first. Like, and it gives basically the villain a chance to do that. Cobra doesn't mess around. Okay. He shoots, he kills, and then he only says stuff unless it's absolutely necessary or it has some sort of purpose. He's a killing machine, much more so than these two. Great, great long answer. Uh, great I, answer. I give you applause for <laughs> that, JTE. You. Here's the problem. Mm -hmm. All those one-liners you're talking about, Cobra is dated. Cobra is very 80s. We're not talking about the movie. We're, we're, we're talking, talking about, about the character, the character. in the battle I'm royale. Talking about, mm -hmm. I'm talking about the character. He's too dated. All those cheesy one-liners, would, they wouldn't hold water he today. My but, argument, hang on, hang on. My argument okay, wait is he doesn't do it. Barney him. Ross. Okay, yeah, he may rely on his team, but guess what? The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. You're only as good as your team. And the fact that he is a great team leader and he brings out the best in his team makes him a stronger character. His team isn't going to be with him, though, and he, he doesn't even control his team very well. Dolph Lundgren is a loose cannon halfway through the first Expendables film. He leaves the team. Hey, nobody's perfect. 
him. Wait. How good of a leader is if one of his best guys leaves and turns on his own team? Did they win? Did, the they, did they win? Did they get their minute? Did he get? Did he? Did they? Did it all turn out well in the end? It's when a Spendables? slow movie. Of yes, he's going to win at the end. Cobra exactly. Doesn't the, have. He's not going up against people that are that bad. He is a guy who works alone. First of all, it's lame to have a name for a group that's just you. That's a weird thing. <laughs> that's a sad, weird thing to no, do. No, there were more. Second they probably all, all died. And oh, he's the only one. We don't know because he never explains. I think he has a club for one to make himself feel better. Second, he doesn't go up against anything close to what Simon Phoenix is. So yeah, you, this guy is able to like casually throw out some one-liners. He's a guy who is not he is not going up against the challenge. He, Simon Phoenix is insane. He, uh, yes, he almost whoa, whoa, uh, my character almost gets killed. Brian but he, Thompson from Cobra is the most insane character Sloan has ever faced in every mo any movie. Any movie? No. no. Come on, Phoenix is laughing, he's joking, he's kicking ass, he's making Jeffrey Dahmer jokes while he's fighting. Freaking Brian Thompson in that movie is a murderous psychopathic axe killer who has a cult with him. Not only does Stallone take on the whole cult and kill them in like some lemon field, he then goes into the freaking iron factory and he kills this dude. And the best thing about it, and this is what makes Cobra better than both these guys, he says, I am where the law ends and justice begins. He basically says, I will go that extra mile where other people won't let me go. That's why he is so badass. And that's why he will kill these guys. before He wouldn't even say anything nice to him before he killed them. He would just kill them. So I, you're underestimating Simon Phoenix here, one of the greatest villains he's of all time. He's one of the most entertaining villains of course of all he is. Time. He's like the Joker. He is a guy who is so crazy that he is not just an intense axe murderer. He is a guy who gets in your head. He's psychological. It's not just a guy who like wields a crazy axe and has like some lo some losers yeah. that are following him into a field. And Stallone goes into a field and kills some people. I this would, guy is not going up against the challenge. I would rather fight a guy who makes a lot of jokes, seems upbeat, and has been trained to do martial arts through a chip than a guy. The chip who, makes it better. He's <laughs> better at that because he's been trained by a computer. It's I'm, not just your human being. Well, I understand that, but I'd rather fight karate than crazy. And Brian Thompson is beyond crazy. He doesn't care about his life. Phoenix wants to live. Brian Thompson just wants to kill as many people as he can. He's a psychopath. Here's where you're both wrong. Here's where you're both wrong. I'm just okay. jumping in now because you guys right, are going go. back and forth. The voice of reason here is that Barney Ross has the brains and he has the bronze. Like you need the bronze to go with the brains. And <laughs> can you give you, an example you, of the brains you, in listen, the movie? You're, you're, ta you're talking about the expendables. You're talking about his character. It's relevant for today. Barney Ross does not feel dated like Cobra. How feels is that going to play into the fight? Yeah, how's that playing into the fight? You're talking about the movies. We're talking because about the characters in the fight. Because he's not just using his muscle, he's mm -hmm. using his brains. And I feel like like Cobra is reckless and that worked in his day. But Barney Ross, yeah, he's got the bronze. And you know what? Don't knock the guy because he's old. He's still frigging got it. And let's, talk, let's talk about hit ratio for, real quick. And this I is use this as your final thoughts. Yeah, one thing I noticed in this movie, half the movie Spartan is shooting at Simon Phoenix. They're not hitting each other. They're just shooting walls. They're hitting everything but each other because the whole movie basically like they they're can't both hit. very good. Yeah, because they're both very well. No, they're just it's an action movie and they're not very good shots and they're just talking. They're Barney Ross both good at dodging is a lot of times just spraying bullets into the air. If you watch Cobra, almost every shot he takes with that gun lands on a target. He's not doing Rambo. Where he's just shooting into the sky. He's not just like <laughs> almost every single shot that he shoots out of his pistol, his gun, his machine gun, his submachine gun hits his target. He's the most efficient killer out of all three of these, by far. And I've right. seen the tape, trust Mike, me. Mike, final thoughts? John Spartan is handcuffed, in a way, by the law, by a code yep. of ethics. Yep. But he ultimately succeeds. When there, If he were to take all the gloves off, not have a code of ethics, not believe in, in, in law and order, he would actually probably be more powerful. But he succeeds in spite of that, which I think makes him a stronger character. Cobra has the, has no rules. He just has a gun. He shoots people. That's great. He's a scary guy. But this John Spartan character is more powerful because with restrictions, he's able to overcome. And Barney Ross do, probably dyes his eyebrows before he goes into <laughs> Again, don't knock the guy because he's old. First of all, Spartan is compared to Cobretti and to Barney Ross. Uh, Spartan's kind of a pussy. He kind of, he really is. I mean, he just doesn't, he's I, just not as strong. Horrendous. He's just not as strong as Cobra or as Cobretti or Barney Ross. And again, Barney Ross, he is he is a legend. He is a legend who can command these big guys and they follow his lead. They work together as a team. It's not just about shooting bullets or punching people in the faces. It's about having the charisma to be a leader in addition to being a, a standalone badass. And that is what he is in The Expendables. He's not going to have his team, though. All right, Dan. <laughs> Just a couple cleanup things. Uh, the it. Zombie Squad was an elite division inside the LAPD. Of course. It's called the Bottom Line in Law Enforcement. Love it. Of which I believe John Cobra or Cobra was the only Mary uh, Cobretti was the only surviving member. 
Uh, we don't know for sure, though. <laughs> we would never know. Uh, Demolition play, uh, Man took place in 2032, so we still have a few more years till we get there, supposedly. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, for our overseas viewers, you may have been confused by Mike uh, referencing Taco Bell. It's because <laughs> in the European market, it was replaced by Pizza Hut. Because yeah. there was no Taco oh. Bell, so there may be some people in Europe. Uh, just substitute Pizza Hut for Taco Bell. I'm a big fan of Pizza Hut, too. Big fan of Pizza Hut. I and, like the uh, combos. Uh, oh, taco and it's great. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. The name Dolph Lundgren was thrown around a few yeah. times. Yeah. Dolph Lundgren. 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 Sorry, uh, Dolph. Who is a uh, like legitimately like a rocket scientist? Yep. Which is yes. crazy when you think about it. He's also uh, the second kindergarten cop. Yeah, that's he right. Was, yeah, yeah, he was. That's too. right. That's yeah. right. And, and uh, uh, as always, we have the viewer poll, Andy, which I will share once you've made your ruling. Well, I got to be honest on this one. I think the advantage definitely played a part. Uh, JT just dropped some real knowledge there of his characters, and I think yeah, yeah. Spartan's got a little bit of that. He doesn't. Have, he's got the rules, mm-hmm. and I think Barney's just yes, uh, not to knock the age, but it's the team. He doesn't have the team, and it's clear he needs that team. So I got to give JT the point. You only earn one point, though. I know. That, if I lost that one, I would have walked off. <laughs> oh. I was like, I'm done. All right, round five. Oh, here we go. Mr. Mance, it's your turn to offer the advantage. You got to pick this. What would you like to do? Let's read it off. Okay, let's read it off here. There's only one question for the Mance advantage. Pitch <laughs> La La Land uh, two. This one. All right, you ready for my pitch? Oh, I'm so ready. Okay, here, here it is. <laughs> Let's hear it. The movie that won Best Picture for a whopping two minutes at the Academy <laughs> Awards, <laughs> yeah. La La Land. Here is the sequel, La La Land 2, City of Stars. This movie is going to be darker and deeper. The first movie, <laughs> I love that. The first movie was a very rose-colored look at L.A. at show business. It was it was a love letter to to Hollywood and Los Angeles. This movie is deeper. It's darker. It is going to be the Empire Strikes Back. Of, oh God! Oh, wait, hang on. It's going to be the Empire Strikes Back of the La La Land cinematic universe. We are talking about a movie that takes place about 10 years. That's the biggest eye roll I've ever (laughs) seen from Dan Merle in my life. Sorry. (laughs) I didn't mean to betray (laughs) you. It's just that every part two is out. the Empire Strikes Back of and the well, cinema. What that back did in my, my right, mom's cinematic right, universe. Sorry. It was the Empire Strikes Back of the cinematic yeah, universe. It's the yeah, Empire yeah. Strikes It's the Wrath of Khan of the La La Land <laughs> cinematic universe. Seb, it takes place about 15, 10, 15 years later. Let's say 15 years later after the original film. Both characters have lost themselves. Seb has sold out. His business, Seb's, has become, what do you know, a restaurant chain. A food chain that so that makes fried fried foods. He's become very very successful as Seb, but he has lost his passion. He lost his vision. He lost his goal. He's rich, but he's unhappy. He's also grossly overweight. Mia has fallen on hard times, and her the roles have dried up. She gave up her career to be a stay-at-home mom, to be a trophy wife to her husband, played by the guy from That Thing You Do. So she goes into one of his chains. <laughs> she goes into one of his chains. I've never chains. seen Mike break this much. <laughs> she goes into one of his chains and she sees Sebastian and she's horrified at what he has become. They look at each other just like they did at the end of the first movie, only this time they don't smile at each other. They both realize that they are unhappy. They, she leaves and just on a whim, she goes back to Griffith Park where they had so many fun times in oh, the yeah. original film. Yeah. And she sees Sebastian. He is ready to jump off the cliff at the oh edge of God. Griffith Park. Jesus. <laughs> because he is, no, no, I'm serious. Okay. He, is re- he's, he realizes that he is sold out and that he lost himself and he's ready to kill himself. What? And just before he jumps, she sings to him, City of Stars. <laughs> Are you shining just for oh me? Oh my god. Wait a minute. No, this is dead <laughs> serious. Okay. Again, this is the Empire Strikes Back of the Lala Lance Cinematic Universe. Is that how it ends? No, no, no. <laughs> That's the midpoint. That's just the midpoint. Okay. So she saves him. So they're sitting on the bench that they sat on near the end of the first movie. Of course. And they realize that they've lost themselves. And he says to her, because she also gave up her dream. You told me that 
that people love what other people are passionate about. They inspire each other to get back to what they what, to back back to what their dreams were. He starts playing the piano again. She starts going out on auditions. She gets a role in an independent film in a supporting role. Very low budget. They need someone to score the music. She recommends Sebastian. He does it. The movie goes to Sundance later in the year. It turns out to be a big hit and they both get nominated for Academy Awards and this time they stay together. Mm. Wow, okay. Uh, JT, let's hear your pitch for La La Land 2. So many problems with your pitch. <laughs> it's right. a pitch. It's yeah, not a screenplay. Here's the deal. Um, I do not want to see Emma Watson and Ryan Gosling back. Uh, it's Emma, Emma, Emma Stone. Stone, Stone. Sorry. Emma, Emma Stone. Stone. Uh, we'll get to, yeah. I don't want to see them. They've told their story. That theme you said about him like selling out, we saw that in the first movie. So <coughs> okay, right, I shouldn't be rebutting. I should just be talking about mine. All right, here we go. La La Land 2. I like, that's what all I'm going to call it. La La Land 2. The title tells you that you could tell another L.A. story that has nothing to do with those two characters, but kind of touching on the same themes, but a different aspect of the business. This is La La Land. There's so many different aspects of this business. I think you could use that same kind of themes, but tell it with new characters and different interesting Are you ways. calling it La La Land 2? I'm calling it La La Land 2. Yeah. Okay. La La Land 2, nothing else, no extra stuff. So I'm going to take two characters. Again, I'm going to bring back Miles Teller, who was originally supposed to star in this film, but couldn't because Ryan Gosling, I guess, was better in it. I don't know why. But I think Miles Teller was so good in Whiplash, and he showed that he knows how to work with his director. But now he's a stand-up comedian. He's a struggling stand-up comedian who goes to the comedy store all the time. He's trying to make he's trying to make it in his business, which is so hard. Anyone who tries to do stand-up knows it's one of the hardest things to break into. He meets a girl who's a f- female screenwriter, played by Haley Steinfeld, who's trying to also break into the business and try to make screenplays that are different, that aren't just action movies and all this stuff. And she's it's a lot about her struggle being a woman screenwriter and his struggle being a comedian. They meet each other. And it's a very similar storyline as far as the first one when it comes to themes, because I think the best sequels, like James Cameron does this, he hits the same beats, but he does it in a new different way with a different angle. So you still feel like you're getting what you wanted from that first movie, but you're getting a new story and new characters. And I think with these two actors, who Hilly Steinfeld coming off Edge of 17, getting one of the best performances, I think, of last year. I think Miles Teller is one of the best working actors right now, spectacular now. He kind of touched on this, and especially with Whiplash. And I think teaming up with Damien Giselle for this sequel, they could kind of... Capture, recapture the spirit of that first film, but tell stories of different people. Not the different themes, but different people. And I think the musical numbers can be really fun. Imagine doing like a comedy store number where all like just all these friends you're introduced throughout the movie, and there's like a scene where there's like a fun song where all the other comedians are kind of like pitching in and doing a thing. And Haley Steinfeld being on set, she actually gets to be on set for while she's writing some of these movies. Maybe she doesn't feel like they're doing a good job. There's a whole sequence where she's going through the stage of the sets of the movie as she's singing about how they're not really putting her screenplay that she wrote to good use. I think it's really Mike good. has looked horrified through a yeah. lot of that pitch. So I can't, wait to, I can't wait to hear this one. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll get, I'll, yeah, I'll we'll get to get, my we'll, pitch. We'll I'll yours. keep my pitch. I, All right, Mupp, it's called Muppets Take La La Land. <laughs> <laughs> okay? We don't want to see the same characters again. Their story is completed. Oh, we want to no. see a similar story, but, but with new characters and characters that we like, okay? Kermit is a struggling banjo musician. <laughs> He's on a lily pad, all right? Miss Piggy is a struggling actress. All right, he, Kermit gets a job with Dr. Teeth and Electric Mayhem in their band. And Piggy, for some reason, is like, why would you do that? You were trying to be a band or a solo artist, which, whatever. And then they, they go struggle, they have a struggle, and there's all your favorites. Fozzie, Bear, this is going to bring the Muppets back into what we like, a Hollywood story. It's not going to be like that show where it was trying to, like, ground it too much. This is going to be fun, glamorous, good songs, characters that we love. All right, Muppets Whoa, take La La Land. Hold on. Okay, both you guys. Listen, that's very funny. But that's funny. How dare you disrespect an Oscar almost winning film like La La Land? I that didn't is disrespect a, it at all. That is a all drama. Right, you guys, and you no, just no. pitched the Muppet movie to guys, me. That's guys, that's what the Muppet movie is. Both you guys. Okay, you pitched a Muppet movie. Did you not pitch, pitch, hang on. You know, you pitched the Muppet movie. Guys, that's exactly what happens in that movie. I love, you, I, love, I love you both like brothers. I really do. Oh, I, sure. respe- I respect the hell out of both of you. Your knowledge, your friendship. Thank you. I think I would take bullets. For both of you Thank guys, you. Don't, but don't these pitches are these pitches are, are are completely crazy. Here's why. Wait a minute. Crazy, 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 crazy. Wait, wait, hang on, just a minute. Just she's a minute. Star, just don't jump minute. off the roof. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're laughing at me. You're okay. not laughing Sorry, at the pitch. Ahead. Okay. <laughs> Seriously, my pitch is solid. You first of all, you think La La Land. You think of Ryan Gosling and Emma Stone. People do not want to see other characters in a movie called La La Land. Another other characters in a movie called La La Land feels like like 
a direct to DVD ripoff streaming. It feels like a like a a B movie. People, let me tell you something. I went to see La La Land the at Jerry the Jerry Seinfeld B movie. No, no, hang on. I went to see La La Land at the Hollywood Bowl. The eighteen thousand mm-hmm. people sold out for two nights. I lost count of all the girls and all the women dressed like Mia, wearing that yellow dress that Emma Stone wore in that dress in, in that movie. That movie touched people. These characters touched people. You cannot take the characters, those characters, out of the film and still call it La La Land. It's and, not La La Land. And, and, First of all, that's second of all. JT, your movie basically is punchline. With uh, starring give, Tom give Hanks. Give Damien a little more credit than that. He's it not going to make Punchline. But but no, that's what you pitched. You pitched a movie Punchline with Tom Hanks and Sally Field. You did not pitch a La La Land movie. And for you to, for both of you guys to say that, oh no, their stories have been done. No one wants to see the continuation of these characters. That's total bullshit. Well, no one wants to see them jump off a cliff. Are you telling well, me, you <laughs> jump off a cliff. Are you telling me that movie didn't end perfectly with how they saw each other? And it, no, no, I, hang on. I feel like I know it where had a great thing. ending. It I, had a great ending. But you know what? A lot of people complained that they wanted to see Mia and Sebastian end up together. No, now, the point was in this darker done. sequel, in this mm-hmm. darker sequel, Very where dark. the stakes the stakes are high because, like, like Sebastian is suicidal because he... <sighs> listen, you're laughing, but I'm, I'm serious. Yeah, I'm really serious. Depressing. You know, it, it, is, it is depressing. It's darker. We're talking, it's like, you know... It's not real, guys. No, it's Sebastian. Yeah. <laughs> you got it. Yeah, this show isn't but real. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> the emotional... Yeah. The emotional impact... Mm-hmm. I mean, look, my pitch may sound funny, but the emotional impact that people will feel when she sees... She sings the song that he wrote for her back to him all those years later, not a dry eye in the house. And people will get what they didn't get at the end of the first move. What they wanted was to see them end up together. They were, they were, their destiny is to be together. So their wait, timing she, was off. So she, what, she leaves her kids, she leaves her husband, she goes moves in with Ryan Gosling. I feel like you're just going against what that movie did. Like, I f- no, no The point. pitch was 90% depressing is yeah, all I'm yeah. saying. No, 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 the movie's when about passion. Let them talk, you got uh, your piece when, of it. When I left that theater, did you say, God, I can't wait to see another movie with these two characters and see where they go? I don't know anybody that said that. That's why I would introduce new characters in La La Land. They're still in La La Land. And you're doing, again, like I said, you got to redo the same themes with different characters. The same no, way you said they, they fell in love with those two characters, just like you said, people are dressed like them. Who's to say he couldn't make a sequel where you fall in love with two totally new characters who aren't just going to be carbon copies of those two, but in different ways and have different kind of attitudes? Uh, I, I, and I, it I, explores a different part of I the business. I get what you're saying. You're, you're saying, okay, well, let's, let's take the theme and apply it to different characters characters, but mm-hmm. your your theme, your different characters, again, you just basically pitched me a movie that's been done and it was called Punchline. I, I have but not what, seen Punchline and, and again, I have no I disagree. desire to see it. Will Reznor do the music <laughs> in your movie? I mean, I, it's 90%. I, you're not, you want the glamour. You want some of the fun of it. It doesn't yeah. sound like that but happens until the no, very end. They bring it back. They bring it back to passion. They People love what it's other people are passionate about. Before the movie's like, over. You know, like the first movie, they gave up the love. They're, they sacrificed their love for each other. They continue. They continue continue following their dreams. And you know what? They realized that their dreams were to be together. And by coming back together, All right. they put their dreams I back I hear a lot of defensive from you. I got to hear more against okay. them. And this, I, the, yeah. this, uh, the musical numbers at the comedy store, I mean, what is it going to be like? The joke's about my penis didn't mm-hmm. work tonight. Mm-hmm. Like, it's not. That's this not bad. Is, comedies, uh, <laughs> That's not bad. Stand-up comedy does not lend itself to the glamour and glitz that you would want I'm in a t- song from La La Land. I'm These t- are like scumbag <laughs> comedians. Like, you want like Bill Burr singing about like no, the, the best, joke about like getting a hand job didn't work. Like, the best thing doesn't the, work. The best thing about a good musical is the different vari- variation of songs. Like, that's going to be one but little it's small not true, song. But it's not true to the stand-up comedian. The type of people that do stand-up are not you people tell me that you can't sing get and a dance. You a writer in there to make a good, like, s- musical with but a bunch of ring, comedians? It will ring very false as far as what stand-up comedians are like. A lot of things ring like. false in La 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 Well, I'm not... <laughs> all right. That's but more so if, if all of a sudden it's like we're getting, like... Mm. I'm going to keep it... I'm going to I'm gonna keep it simple. Yeah. Okay, your movie is not La La Land. It's a Muppet movie. It is not it La La, is La Land. But it's, it's also La La Land. It's not Muppet movie. Maybe a spoof of La La Land, mm-hmm. which I'm sure someone's going to do a spoof of La La Land it's, sooner or later, mm-hmm. but your movie is a spoof of, it's not La La Land, it's a Muppet movie. Your movie is Punchline, it's not La La Land. And but Miles Teller, Miles Teller, line. wait a minute, Miles Teller, mm-hmm. that's who you pitched? Yeah. He did not do La La Land for a reason. What reason was it? Doesn't thought, matter. I, I thought it was because he, he lost it to Ryan Gosling. Uh, you know what? Well, I he, cannot say. Was why he not he amazing in Whiplash? Way to, dry, he's way great to dangle that out and that not reveal, not, man. That is a different movie. He's great in Whiplash. Yeah, he was great in Bleed for but this. But in Spectacular now Whiplash, he could do some of those similar things. The angst, somebody who's struggling through life that needs to find their way. All right. I feel like the, he could do it. All right. I hear, so we have 
the, a real dark direct sequel from yeah. Mance. We have the Muppet version with the Muppet Mike. Movie. We have uh, the new character version with GTO. Yeah. And uh, so, exploring a new side of the and business. And your closing arguments for here to the pitch of why we want to go. And Andrew, I hope you're listening because I'm. You're going to help me buy a ticket to one of these. Because uh, we got the audience has yeah. to help pick on this one. The question why is, is yours the best continuation of La La Land? My, and that can be brought. That doesn't mean literally. Here, here it is. Simple. I'm not going to talk any longer. Just to say, this is. I asked for a sequel to La La Land. Pitch a sequel to La La Land. Pitch, Pitch La La, 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 La Land, Land two. 2. This is La La Land 2. A continuation of the story, a continuation of the characters, where we get what we really did want the first time, which was to see them get her. You get it in the sequel. JT? I think La Land is more than just two characters. I think it's about the themes, about what's representing, and more importantly, Hollywood and L.A. and what happens and the experiences that people have in here. One of the things that's so great about La Land is so many people have different experiences, and you explore it with new and different characters. I'm not talking about putting some B-movie actors in here. I'm talking about two people who are some of the best young actors working today who can make you fall in love with them just like you did with Emma and Ryan Gosling. And David Giselle coming back, he's not going to make Punchline 2. He's going to make a great sequel to La La Land that I think would absolutely be on part with the first one it could even be nominated for stuff i can't see either of these movies being nominated for anything and i think it's a disjustice to the first film to continue that story when i think it ended i can't think of a better ending for la land one of the best things about that movie was the ending i and that's i don't want to ruin that i don't want to ruin that ending with a sequel Mike? Okay, what movie do you want to see of I, the three of these? <laughs> I, this may be similar to the Muppet movie, but the Muppets need a movie to reset them. The, the other Jason Siegel Muppet movies were fine, but this is a movie, the spirit of La La Land, the fun, the pageantry, the big musical numbers in this movie honestly make the most sense. As far as this, this is a crazy dark movie. I, I don't know who would be happy with this. People would be so ups- People would be very upset <laughs> that they love La La Land and they go and they watch the, the characters get overweight and depressed and like... There would be people would be foaming at the mouth if they saw this. And Same this, with yours. No, they wouldn't. I don't want no, to see no, it. People, people, people would be like, oh, that's weird. And then they'd be like, I love Kermit. These musical numbers are delightful. And as far as this, the world just doesn't make sense. You can't have a glamorous musical that's fun at the comedy store. These, I, I look, one, I do comedy for number. a living. These are loser scumbags, people. <laughs> people don't want to see these people. We that, also have all these the shows. About. People, yeah, but who wants to see that? That's not the spirit of hard times. By the way, it is fun. By the way, you talk about a movie where it ended and it felt like everything wrapped up at the end. A movie that did not need a sequel, but it got one and it was actually really damn good. Star Wars. Star Wars ended oh, perfectly. Oh, no. It was based, Star- on, wait, it was based on. on serial? That, but, no, it wasn't based on anything. It was a standalone um, movie. It was a standalone movie that had a great ending. It would have been just fine if they just left it at the end of that. And what did it get? It got the Empire Strikes Star- Back. Star Wars is an action adventure. Uh, it doesn't matter. Dan, it doesn't Dan matter. dismay. Dan and dismay over there. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, this was hard. Dan's upset with all of us for this different reasons, just, I think. This was a hard so question. So many Problems? puzzling and frustrating things that came out of that round. <laughs> mm. I love Fair La enough. La Land. Yeah, me too. Scott I and I, I, like La La. I used to think we're on the same page. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> first of all, Scott. His name is Tom Everett Scott. He played Guy Skitch <laughs> Patterson. <laughs> Drummer for the Wonders. Show some respect. Yeah, I, I kind of look like him too, don't I? Uh, I will say People it's very interesting like yeah, um, to the viewers who are usually very polite and nice got a little nasty during this round. Oh. I will say that there is a, there is a favorite uh, both in the poll and just through reaction and uh, and a couple of audience things that uh, I can't say before Andy gets to his judgment. I will say I have a favorite. Yeah, okay. It's one that I would go see. Uh, uh, by far. I want to hear some of the audience. So Andrew is sitting there. Help me. Which one would you buy the ticket to and tell me why? And I go unconventional. I'd go to see the Muppets one. Oh my god. <laughs> I mean, he sold me on it. It would be delightful and have the good music. I love the Muppets. It's not a lot. It's everything I want. Yeah, it's not a lot. It's the Muppets. I have the same problem of that's the one I definitely buy the ticket to. Of course. Because why? Of course I you would. I thought I was going to lose here's this. The, here's the, here's here's the not, problem. You're not seeing La La Land. Here's the problem. Uh, yeah, both of these movies in a way. Uh, I mean, JT did say it too, but them not getting together was sort of the point mm-hmm. of the movie. So when they go, he's killing himself and yeah. doing all the, and then they get together. And yeah. it, it it really leaves sort of a sour taste in what La La Land is. And then, JT, I like this idea of new characters, but 
different the, aspects the of the screenwriter business. and the comic. I don't know. I just felt uh, you were closer. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, based on the Are options, you kidding me? I gotta go Muppets. Are you kidding Son me? of a bitch. Yeah. I gotta yeah. go with Andrew and go with the Muppets. Really? Dan, what, what's going on over there? The audience called this fight 15 minutes ago. The audience, <laughs> the audience called this fight after Mike's opening statement. This was by far the only answer for anybody watching. I hate. I'm sorry, the Scott. Percentage? I'm sorry, JT. <laughs> what? This was the so only answer for people watching the show live. I'm wow. going to be honest. That was the only answer for me. <laughs> and I love La La Land. And that's still the only one that that's I personally would go see. All right. So I'm glad we were all on the same page. I wasn't un- online, but I'm glad we are. We could agree for once. Yes. Um, uh, that 40, puts Mike in the lead with three points because you just earned two on that. 44% voted for Muppets, uh, 37%. But here's oh, what's well, interesting. Scott and JT are tied at two points. Woo. Wow. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> what? How much? How long has this show been? Yeah. It seems it feels like an hour. <laughs> well, yeah, we have a little delay yeah. too. Yeah. Uh, so I feel like we shouldn't do this bonus question. We're a little long, right? Yeah. Do we yeah. Speed on? Okay, yeah, 48. Yes, cool. Oh, yeah. Let's, so I'm going to cut. Let's, uh, all right, well. So we just need a tie break between the. We need a tie I break. I got to get back to my kids. <laughs> let's let's do it. Kids. Let's do say, the bonus yeah. as a tie break. Okay. Am okay. I in the tie break? No, you're not. Okay. You're Can I go, could I go pee? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we were going to ask this movie question. Uh, favorite movie. We were going to have Mike debate E.T., mm-hmm. but I'm going to cu- cancel his out because he's out. And he, he's in this week. That means, Mance, we're going to... Basically, we're picking the favorite movie that you were known for on this show. Yeah. So, Mance, Wrath of Khan, mm-hmm. J.T.E. Rocky. Uh-oh. We're going to do this in a speed round approach. Speed round approach? Oh, speed round Tell approach. Tell me why oh. this is the better film. Mm-hmm. Wrath of Khan versus Rocky. Everyone clear? We're going to do a speed mm-hmm. round. Let's give them, what are we, 30 seconds? Let's we'll do thir- give them 30 seconds. Let's do 30, 30 seconds. 30 and 15. 30 and 15. Perfect. I love it. Thank yeah. you for that. All right. No ET there, but yeah, yep. that's fine enough. <laughs> we can lose that one. Okay, wow. so we're adjusting our bonus just in case. I wanted to have it just in case because uh, the, the point system shifted a little bit this game. Uh, but now, uh, Wrath of Khan versus Rocky. Uh, let's. Uh, I have a number behind my back. Closest to it wins. Four. Two. I should have clarified. <laughs> <laughs> what? Let's try it again. Two. Three. Yes, you can pick three. Okay, now that's clean. <laughs> <sighs> All right, Tachi, you'll go first or second. Um, I'll go. I'll go second. Okay, here we go. Mance, you'll have 30 seconds on the clock. Time begins when you begin speaking. Okay, Star Trek to the Wrath of Khan. It's the Citizen Kane of Star Trek movies, the only movie that transcends the series and the sci fi genre itself. It deals with the universal themes of getting older, harkens back to Shakespeare, Melville, and Charles Dickens. The stakes are high, has it all action, heart, humor, strong characters, great action. The scene where Spock dies is so emotional. The Leonard Nimoy, William Shatner, they're the top of their game. Uh, Volcaro Montalban, one of the best villains ever. Uh, it's devastating, and it's a movie that you watch over and over and over and over again. Okay. You just read all that, by the way. Well, so <laughs> let's go. <laughs> all right, all right, hold on. Okay, let's go. Rocky is one of the best films of all time. It's in AFI's Top 100. I believe it was around number 56. It won. It was nominated for four different Oscars. It won Best Picture for Stallone and uh, Erwin Winkler and Robert Chardoff for producers. Stallone created a character that has stood the test of time. People will see a movie, they go, that's the Rocky of this. That's the Rocky of that. People don't really talk about Wrath of Khan so much. They go, oh, that's the Empire Strikes Back of that. At Wrath of Khan, I'm sorry to say, doesn't really hold up too much to me. When I watched it, it felt dated. Unless you really know Star Trek, you can't go into that movie and really get all out of it. Unless you you knew that series. Rocky? Let's disagree. Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan transcends Star Trek. It is the movie that all the other Star Trek movies and most sequels are judged along with The Empire Strikes Back. It is a movie that you do not need to be a Star Trek fan. You didn't have to watch the original episode. It is just a great movie that has, it has more than Rocky. Action, heart, humor, and whatever. 15 seconds when you're ready. Oh, it's 15? Yes. I disagree. I watched Star Trek Wrath of last year. I saw some of the effects were out. Also, there's some stuff with his history of Shatner's character in Kirk. I didn't know what was going on. It was like a s- weird kid. The effects look really bad. It just It's not a good film. Rocky is an icon. Stallone was nominated for Oscar. There was so many more sequels that did way better, and he was nominated last year for Creed. Not more, no, not more sequels. No way. There were Rocky sequels are better than this. All right. I want to give you... Give me 10 more seconds. Cut through the bullshit. Mm-hmm. What's really the heart of the matter here? Why is Rocky better than Wrath of Khan? Why is Wrath of Khan better than Rocky? 
Go ahead, five seconds. Wrath of Check. Khan has more than Rocky. Rocky, Wrath of Khan is about friendship. Wrath of Khan has action, it has humor, it has heart. It is devastating, the history of these characters. One of them dies. Okay, JT. Hold on, hold on. Rocky is more iconic, he's a more famous character. In that movie, the reason why it works today, it doesn't feel dated because it's about the character. It's about the interaction between him and Adrian and all the supporting cast. That movie is a perfect film when it comes to acting. Hey, Andrew, what do you think based on those arguments? I gotta go Wrath of Khan. Oh, really? What, what did you hear in the arguments that you liked? I don't know, just, it felt more passionate. Huh. Passion. Hmm. How dare you question my passion about Rocky, yeah, I, sir? I heard some serious passion from JT. <laughs> That's one thing I got passion for. That doesn't help me. That doesn't we're help both, me. We're both very passionate about yes, these movies. Yes, we are. So I didn't hear as much criticism against Rocky. I didn't hear any. As I heard against Wrath of Khan. So that, to me, was the outlier. I think, Mance, you told me why it's a good film, but I did hear more from JT as to why... Uh, man, uh, Wrath of Khan has some flaws. So for that reason alone, I thought they both were pretty passionate. So, but that's the the card for me. So I got to give JT the tiebreaker. JT gets it, but very close. Good, good, good round of job. applause for Mance. Good Bravo. Job. I'm gonna go to Griffith Ooh. Park and jump off a cliff. <laughs> no, oh, no, 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 no! Don't, don't wearing the shirt, city too, no! City of stars. Don't oh, shine just for me. me. Don't jump. <laughs> Just for JT. Movie <laughs> man. Oh, no. We should point out that that point does not carry over. Yeah, that does so not carry over. It's Mike so 3, no point JTE 2, right. entering yeah. the speed round. Yeah. So Mike still has the advantage, JT, okay? No got pressure it. there. We got it. All right, now Mance, this is where you get your revenge. This show sucks. I'm so nervous. <laughs> uh, Mance, you can help me here. Andrew, you'll be helping me here because Dan cannot because that would be unfair. Yeah, that's true. How did you feel that last ruling, Dan, so far on the show? I'm just curious. I, I would have 100% gone, and I love Wrath of Khan, but I would have 100% gone with JTE. He got a really good argument in there. He's like, they don't call things the Wrath of Khan of movies. They call them the Empire Strikes Back. And he's like, that's a really interesting way to look at it. And then I, I agree. And they Mance did not Rocky. hit Rocky at all. He was on the defensive. <laughs> and I think in the game, you have to play both sides. Got to play both sides. All right, here we go. Speed round. You know how this works for all the marbles. The winner of this, Mike's Mike tough. Carlson, Mike's JTE, one of you will this. finally get that seat against the uh, champion over there. You might be able to taste that belt. Oh, I'd love to put oh, that belt in my mouth. That shivers. <laughs> I'd love to taste that belt. Mm. Oh, so here we go. I got some weird ones here. All right. Wouldn't want it any other way. Mm -hmm. Round one. Here we go. Boss Baby or Captain Underpants? Captain Boss Underpants. Baby. Oh, wow. Oh, nice. Okay. <laughs> I heard uh, yeah, JT. I, I heard Mike first, and you said Boss. No, he said it first. No, sorry, I'm losing track. What did you say, JT? Captain for sure Underpants. said it first. Okay, Captain Underpants and uh, Boss Baby for Mike. All right, you're first, JT, whenever uh, you're ready. Captain Underpants is based on a very popular book that kids actually love, and they actually did it. They actually took the book from screen and made it better than what it was. That's one of the hardest things to do with movies. The thing with Boss Baby, it's a one joke thing. It's Alec Baldwin talking like a little baby. It's kind of dumb. Captain Underpants actually has some really fun elements that kids can be to, and the kid two protagonists are messing with their teacher, which is something every kid wants to do. It's a fantasy film for kids. Uh, Alec Baldwin ele elevates anything he's in. Boss Baby is a very funny idea. Look, a baby should not be a boss. A boss should be a tall person, a regular sized person. It's not. This is a baby. This is seeing a baby do all the things. A boss does a million things. It fires people. It puts things together. It goes to a boardroom. Seeing a baby do all of these different things that a boss does, which is infinite, is very funny and interesting. Captain Underpants is just some kid dressed up. It's not... Once again, I go back to Boss Baby. It's a one-joke film. There's nothing else there. It's just Alec Baldwin doing his shtick. Captain Iron Pants actually tells a fun story where the characters actually learn something by the end of the movie. They learn to respect their teacher. No one knows what Captain Underpants' shtick is. At least Alec Baldwin has a shtick that, shtick that we all know about. So at least I know what Boss Baby is all about. For the casual viewer, they know who Boss Baby is as a character. Ooh, all right. That was what? tough. I will say for the record, they're both very one-note. <laughs> but... 
That's fine. Uh, that. Based on their arguments, yes. Uh, Mance, where do you stand? I still go with JT because he he he. I, I like that he said that there was a message to it. It wasn't just a, a shtick movie. He, and I didn't see either film, but I thought JT had it, the stronger. It does have a message? Yep. Did you actually see the films? Or are you guessing the books? I know the books. <laughs> <laughs> what did you see, Boss Baby? What's the I message? didn't see Boss Baby. What's the I message? saw both. The reason I didn't see Boss Baby is because it was one note. <laughs> I was like, I know uh, the joke. From well, he, but whether he made it up or not, yeah. he's right. But uh, well, they both have messages, but I think. I'm but Pants has a Definitely friendship more. message a little bit more. Uh, uh, thoughts? You can't chime in, Dan. Uh, Andrew? I'd have to go with Boss Baby. It was that dig in at the end that I know the character going in. I don't know anything about Captain Underpants, and it just seemed confusing watching the trailer for it. Mm -hmm. but They're watched, both confusing, that's a for the record. Opinion. <laughs> They're I mean, both confusing. For the, Captain Underpants is not an actual... Yeah, it's the principal under hypnosis. It's, yeah. a whole, it's very confusing. Uh, uh, no one said that. They're very outlandish uh, premises. Yeah, it, but yeah... Uh, that, that was a, that was Mike's best point, but I heard more than that from JT in the first round. Mm -hmm. So I got to give JT the first point. Tied mm -hmm. up. Oof, that was tough. Uh, so we're tied. Okay. Yeah. Uh, boss baby always screaming. <laughs> boss baby. Yeah, boss baby. <laughs> All right, here we go. Best movie featuring Brendan Fraser. The Mummy. Uh, it's Encino Man. <sighs> oh. What do you mean, oh? <laughs> that is okay. All right, JT, you're first. The moment was the first time I saw Brendan Fraser as something else than just a comedian. He actually showed that he could be almost like an Indiana Jones type. I watched this movie a week ago and I was absolutely blown away by how much fun I was having. He nails the one-liners. It's such a th thin line between being able to pull off an action film and actually having the humor to balance the both for it. He did in that movie is fantastic. It's fun, it's got horror, it's got special effects. It's a summer blockbuster. Uh, Encino Man is a fun and unique movie in the 90s, and it takes my former boss, Pauly Shore, and it makes the best thing he's in. He's great. We love him in it. That's the thing to launch his career. Brendan Fraser is great. He's so likable, and it's its its own unique thing. Mummy is just sort of this Indiana Jones ripoff, and it's fine, but it's not that memorable, really. I don't remember a single thing about it when I'm thinking back to seeing it when the theater. Encino Man is something where you were. Nobody remembers Encino Man. That's Paulie Shore and Sean Astin's movie, and he, it's almost like Weekend at Bernie's, but with a caveman. It's just a dumb premise that when you watch it, you're like, eh, whatever. The Mummy actually has scenes that are spectacular. The scene where he's in the... Oh, I didn't get to see. Encino Man is a movie with a dumb premise that pulls it off and is memorable. The Mummy... What happened? What, there's a mummy in I don't remember. He runs away from a big cloud of dust. That's all I really remember. That's, I mean, the, that's the scene I was just about the, to talk about. The dust scene? <laughs> <laughs> I was about to see the scene with the gun. That's perfect. You backed up my point. Andrew, come <laughs> to you. No, hang on. <laughs> Well, uh, JT, we'll talk after this. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, Andrew, based on those arguments. Uh, JT, it sounded like you hit more points on The Mummy and why it was better. Mance? I like Mike's argument. I yeah. go with Mike. Oh, wow. I, have, I have the same problem. I don't remember anything about The Mummy. <laughs> and even when you said it, you said <laughs> the scene with the running away from the dust. When I think of The Mummy, I think of Raiders of the Lost Ark, because that's what that movie uh, wanted to be. Sadly, unless you got more specific, it might have helped JT get that point, but I gotta give I gotta give Mike the point oh. with Mance there. Uh, uh, JT, this is a bit of an unforced error. What did I say? When your opponent says there's only one memorable scene from the movie, <laughs> and then you say, that's the scene I was no, about no, to no, say! No, no. I was trying to say that was a great... That backs his no, point no, up. No, no, no. <laughs> That was off the clock. That was a scene yeah. I love, though. All right. Uh, <laughs> I love that dust Here we go. Scene. Number three. So we're still tied. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm, 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 no, you're ahead by one. one. I'm ahead by one. That's right. Thing. I had, did have the correct. All right. <sighs> Best moment in a movie where a character says the movie's title. Oh. oh the Rock. Uh... Ten seconds. It's it's we're arguing for the movie, right? Best moment Best in a movie. Moment. Man, five seconds. Wow. My, Two seconds. I'm about the whiff. Walk hard. <laughs> Does he <laughs> say? He might have said it. Well, Walk hard. Well, I gotta I gotta believe you. Okay. I'm sure he may have said it at some point. Here, I look forward to this. I argument. gotta look. I gotta look it up now. Okay. Yeah. All right. Here we go. JT. It's in the song. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Uh, 
When we saw the trailer for The Rock, we knew exactly what they were talking about. Alcatraz. A scene of Navy SEALs were going to go with Sean Connery to break into one of the one prisons that you can't break out of. The whole movie builds up to this point where they go underwater. Ed Harris, this guy who's a bad guy, but you kind of like him. You know that eventually it's all going to come down to this one big conclusion where they have to face each other. In the scene where Sean Connery opens the door, after he goes through like this spinning furnace, Okay, that was a description. Yep. Walk hard, uh, walk hard. Look, the scene where, uh, where John C. Riley and Krista Weir are in the kitchen. This is a very underrated, very funny movie. And the moment he says walk, he has to walk hard. Uh, uh, it, it leads right into the titular song of the thing, which is very. That's quick. Like oh, sorry, that sorry. I apologize. Like... <laughs> that was an right. inadvertent. I was in speed. I was in second. He's just yeah. not into it. No, I, well, no, I, I, have, I have to look up whether Walk Hard is in the it, movie. It is, it right? Is. It's, it's the song. Of the song. Okay, yeah, yeah. 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 keep going. So he'll he'll give you a couple buffer. Okay. Yes. Um, and uh, the moment is, is the. It's a very funny moment because it sends up the trope that's in every other movie where like somebody gets their hit song and it's always something so contrived. So they're taking that moment, they're sending it up, they're making it very funny, and then they're leading right into the song Walk Hard, which is a very funny Johnny Cash parody, which is a great moment. The line, the rock, and the rock is one of the, follows a great moment where he goes through this crazy death trap of a furnace. He comes out, and only the way Sean Connery can deliver as a great actor, it says, welcome to the rock. And you're on board. Is that it, or is Mike have more time? Yeah. Uh, that, no, Mike, it's 10 seconds. I'm saying. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, the moment, welcome to the rock, is just like him saying, hey, here we are. We're at the thing. Walk hard is actually the main moment of, the, that's when the movie really takes off. That is the, that is the core of the movie in that moment. The, what? <laughs> Scott, who's gonna shake your head? Andrew, I'll take the blame for part of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but not the whole thing. <laughs> Andrew? We gotta go with JTE. It sounded that yeah. line. No one sounded remembers better. Walk hard. Yeah. yeah. Hey, well, yeah. Welcome to Jurassic Park. Probably. Would have been oh, that's better. a good oh. one. Damn. That's a good one. All right, yeah, JTE. I agree. You get the yeah. points. We're tied again. We're tied okay. Again. Is this? Oh, we're tied. Where are we at here? Uh, no, that was third. Four, four, okay. four. Yeah, yeah we have still... two, two more questions left. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Oh, Me and Mad Dash uh, picking from this list. Okay, here we go. Uh. If Rick Moranis would return for just one new film, what role do you want him to revisit? Um, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Oh, uh, Little Shop of Horrors. Ooh. That's so man, I'm glad I didn't get this far. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I did not get this far, guys. All right, Little Shop of Horrors <laughs> versus... Uh, uh, sorry, you said Honey, honey I, shrunk I Shrunk the Kids, kids yeah. yeah. All right, uh, Mike, you're first this time. Okay, uh, Little Shop of Horrors is a beloved movie. It's something that people really love and would like to see again. Honey, I Shrunk the Kids are like kind of schlocky now, like straight to DVD movies that he did. Like he did three of them. No one is really interested in seeing that. Little Shop of Horrors at least is an interesting uh, idea that you would maybe want to see where he's at, where that character is at, what that universe is like. Because there were so many fun characters, there's so many different side plots that we would be very excited to go see and explore that universe again. TT. I want to see Honey Shrunk the Kids because Rick Moranis could actually benefit from where we are now in technology. You saw Ant-Man, the things they did with that film, the 3D, like for the first time I felt like something was actually shrunk. And Rick Moranis could actually continue a storyline with this. He's always doing adventures. He blew up a kid, he shrunk a kid. It could be a whole new adventure, whereas yours, it's it's just, it's kind of lame. Because I'm like, where are you going with that? Uh, the technology has nothing to do with Rick Moranis' yeah. performance. That's just like maybe that the ant will mm -hmm. look better. Uh, my movie is something that people would be excited about. Honey, I Shrunk the Kids is like everyone's 10th favorite Rick Moranis movie. No one would want to see that again. People love... Little Shop of Horrors told its story. It's a very well-known story. There's really nowhere else to go with it. The plant dies. Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, he's a mad scientist. You could continue that story. Rick Moranis does nothing better than playing the lovable scientist who's a family man. That's it? Okay. Ooh. Andrew, based on their arguments... I think a little shop of horrors. That's I'd want to see that more. I was sold more. I wanted to hear a a dark honey. I shrunk the kids. <laughs> dark <laughs> universe. Kill <laughs> 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 no, City of stars. Empire Strikes Back. Of the uh, 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 man. So what do you think based uh, on those arguments? I I, I was kind of intrigued by seeing where the character was going to go in the continuation of Honey I Shrunk the Kids. So I'm going with JT. Wow, okay, back to me, yeah. Where I was stuck was he's sort of done them a lot, and then, as you said, he's, he, that's, which is a good point, he's sort of been stuck in that treading of those direct-to-sequels. Uh, there's a lot of that universe of Little Shop of Horrors that is appealing to me. Although your technology thing was a good argument. You, it would look really cool nowadays. I thought but we have Ant-Man. Uh, you didn't say that, but... Yeah, we have uh, I gotta go over the fact that we've seen so many of them already in the direct-to-sequels. 
uh, to have him come back to do that seems a little weird. So I'm giving Mike that point. Wow. Okay. So you gotta win this, you one, gotta win this one to force a tie. Correct. Uh, okay. Great. It's tough. This game is tough. In honor of the Pentagon Papers, what movie has the best ensemble cast? JFK. Boogie Nights. Ooh. We got JFK and Boogie Nights. Ensemble cast. I heard JFK first. Mm -hmm. Mike, you're ready when you're. He was JFK. Oh. Yeah, I was JFK. Oh, sorry. I heard JFK first. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you go. Sorry. Yes, go ahead, JT. I mean, I could just list all the actors in that movie. I mean, Kevin Bacon, Tom Lee Jones, um, Walter Matthau, John Candy. He takes actors like Kevin Bacon, and he puts them in situations that you wouldn't really see him in and shows you another side of each actor. When I saw John Candy play that Mississippi governor, I was like, oh, my God, that's amazing. I've never seen John Candy do something like that. All those characters, including Joe Pesci, uh, Kevin Costner, who plays perfect in that film. Uh, Boogie Nights is an amazing cast, and it's, it utilizes the cast the best of almost any movie. I mean, there, there are side characters that barely have very much screen time, but you remember them so well, like William William H. Macy, John C. Riley, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman's character, I don't know, he probably has 15 lines. I, I remember it so vividly, I remember the character. This is a movie that crackles to life. Every single person matters in this movie. The cast is incredible. They all went on to do amazing things, and this is so... Boogie Nights is good, but they don't. I, I, I disagree. Don Cheadle, I felt like at times wasn't really explored enough. And there are other characters that were just kind of touched upon. These characters aren't asked to do too much, they're asked to do just enough. Scenes with Gary Oldman carrying throughout this film, Donald Sutherland giving that speech. Uh, the, my movie asks everybody to do very a lot with a little, and they do it. They 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 crackle to life. They they make every the most out of every moment. This this movie more than JFK is something where you remember every character, every. Per Wow, that was, that was tough. a tough one. That's tough. Uh, yeah, what I, I heard, I, I liked, JT gave me a really good list, and he did, he put those people in different places, that we, had, we don't expect them, but then Mike gave me a little bit more of the memorableness of each one, so that's where I'm uh, on the fence. Mance, what are thoughts? That was, uh, that's tough. Um, you know, I, I gotta go with doing more with a little for Boogie Nights. Mike. Andrew, that's what do you think? I was with you. This was a tough one, also. I mean, I've seen both movies, and I don't remember anything about JFK. What? Oh, so go watch so. it again. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta go with Boogie Nights on this one, also. The the small screen time for the characters really stuck with me. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't go as far as I don't remember, but I, I don't disagree. I get what the point of what you're trying to make. If it's Boogie Nights is more memorable uh, with its cast and with its performances. Uh, so I think I gotta. That's what an ensemble cast is. It's not just a celebrity list. It's the yeah. characters you relate to. And so I heard a little bit more of that from Mike. So Mike gets the point, and therefore Mike, he gets the win. Mike Carlson has another shot at the belt. Wow, look at this. I'm impressed, sir. Wow, good job. Uh, Dan Merle, are you sweating over there? What do you think of that one? I I knew that who, who whomever would graduate from this panel would be a tough opponent, and uh, Mike, we will be fighting one on one uh, for man. the hardware. And uh, I can't think of anyone whose strategy is more antithetical to mine than Mike Carlson. <laughs> That's so this yeah. is going to be a very interesting title fight. No, for sure. I'm excited. Uh, JT Movie Mance, wow, you guys really brought it today. Very close effort there. Uh, Got to give each of you thanks. Uh, JT on uh, uh, JT Movie Thinks on yep. Twitter. On Twitter, JT Movie Thinks, YouTube. Also, I do a daily show on the Anchor app where I just talk about movies and whatever's going on out there. Check it out. Do check it out. Mike Carlson at Fat Carlson. Mm -hmm. What would you like to send the crowd to? Uh, same stuff I've been saying. Netflix movie, Handsome. Um, complicated, I'm in. If you like, go to my Twitter. It's on. Uh, it's a little. I have a little role in uh, Craig Healy, uh, Clip Cup yeah, host. I, I watched. Did you watch it? You oh, like yeah. it? It's great. It's crazy. Uh, uh, yeah, and uh, you know, follow me on Instagram. It's I'm like not a parody tired. of Louie and all those shows. Uh -huh. It's really crashing and everything. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, check me out there. Uh, you know, good job. Killing it. You can catch me on Axis Hollywood and Axis Hollywood Live, or you can just follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Movie Mance. Movie Mance, Movie Mance. City of Stars. Uh, <laughs> don't you shine brightly today? <laughs> Not that that was one of my favorite rounds. <laughs> that, I mean, a lot of people got upset, but I loved it. That was Why great. do people get upset? Oh, I, I don't know. Retweet her. Re -re -tweet her. Uh, Dan Merle at Merle Dan on uh, Twitter and such. At Merle Dan on Twitter and such, and um, yeah, time to go into training. And, yeah, uh, I this think is gonna uh, be tough. Yep, in, a, in the next month or so, that fight we'll, we're gonna align our schedules and make this a big to do, and it's yeah. gonna be a it's gonna be woo, a barn burner. It is. You're gonna one be on gone one, Mike Carlson, yeah. Dan Merle, Can and I'll be, be gone next week. Dan will be stepping in to judge yep. a special Pixar fights next week. 
uh, Perry Nemiroff and uh, Pixar theorist John Negr oh, and some uh, John and uh, uh, the third is uh, TBD. TBD. But uh, it's gonna be a good show, so tune in. Andrew, thanks for coming. Thank you so much for having me. This was a blast. Hope you had fun. You you were instrumental in this one. Uh, and thank you all at home for watching. As always, we love you, and we will be back next week, uh, same time, same channel. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.